Do you find yourself struggling with managing and organizing large amounts of data in your work or personal life? If so, you aren't alone. But there's a solution to your problems, and it's called Excel. If you're looking to become an Excel pro or just enhance your Excel skills, then look no further. I am here to guide you on a journey to unlock the full potential of Microsoft Excel. As the world's most popular data management tool, Excel is an incredibly powerful and versatile program that can help you get organized and make sense of your data. In this course, I will teach you everything you need to know to master Excel. We will start by covering the basics, like navigating the Excel interface and referencing cells within a spreadsheet. From there, I will show you how to create formulas and functions to perform complex calculations, extract data with advanced functions like VLOOKUP, XLOOKUP, and even HLOOKUP. If you also get to clean and organize your data for better understanding and merge and join data from multiple sources. I will also teach you how to represent data visually by creating charts and pivot tables. You can also analyze data with pivot charts and then build professional and impactful dashboards to present your data. We'll also learn how to format to work. I will even show you how to use the search and find function to save time, freeze panes to easily navigate your data, and any more advanced tips and tricks to enhance your productivity. By the end of this course, you will be a confident and productive Excel user. With step-by-step -step instructions, practical examples, and hands-on exercises, you will be able to apply your newfound knowledge to real-life scenarios and enhance your data management skills. So if you're ready to take your Excel skills to the next level, enroll in this course today and let's get started. Excel is everywhere. Everyone uses Excel. It's one of the most popular programs in history, especially for business use. So it does make sense that you want to know more about it. And this course is designed for you to get up and running with Excel and become a solid user. What is Excel? Microsoft Excel is a powerful data visualization and analysis software, which uses spreadsheets to store, organize, and track data sets with formulas and functions. Excel is used by anyone from accountants to data analysts and marketers or even entrepreneurs. I'm sure you know this and I don't need to convince anyone that Excel is pretty popular. It's part of the Microsoft Office suite of products. Alternatives can include Google Sheets and Apple's Numbers, but Excel is by far the most used. So what is Excel used for? Excel is used to store, analyze and report on large amounts of data. It is often used by accounting teams for financial analysis, but can be used by any professional to manage long data sets. Examples of Excel applications can include balance sheets, budgets, or even editorial calendars. Now, Excel is primarily used for creating documents because of its strong computational powers. You'll often find it in accounting offices because it allows accountants to automatically see sums, averages, and totals. With Excel, they can easily make sense of their business's data. That being said, even though Excel is primarily known as an accounting tool, professionals in any field use its features and formulas because it can be used for tracking any type of data. It removes the need to spend hours and hours counting cells or copying and pasting any performance numbers. Excel typically has a shortcut or quick fix that speeds up the process. Here are just a few uses of Excel. You can crunch some numbers with Excel. You can create budgets, tabulate expenses, analyze survey results, and perform just about any type of financial analysis you can think of. You can create a variety of highly customizable charts with Excel. You can also organize lists. You can use the row and column layout to store lists efficiently. You can manipulate text. You can clean up and standardize text-based data, and it can be a large amount of data. You can access other data, so you can import data from a variety of sources with Excel. You can also create dashboards where you summarize a large amount of business information in a nice, concise format. You can also create graphics and diagrams. You use shapes and smart art to create professional looking diagrams for your organization. And you can even automate complex tasks. You can perform a tedious task with a single mouse click with Excel's macro capabilities. Now, we will see a lot of these uses in this course. So why don't we go ahead and start playing around on Excel. I'll see you in the next lecture. Bye. Okay, so let's go ahead and open Excel. And when you open Excel, this is what you'll see. I am using Excel 365 for Mac. And if you're using the Windows one, you may see some small differences. 
Also just keep in mind of the version you are using as well. Now the things we will be working on in this course shouldn't differ too much across different platforms or devices, but please let me know if it does and I'll make a note of it in the lectures. This section is for beginners and goes through opening Excel and various parts of Excel. If you are comfortable, feel free to skip the next few parts. So when you open Excel, this is what you'll see. There's a bunch of Excel templates and on the left here is just whether you want to go to home, which is this pane, if you want to create a new file, if you want to view your recently opened and used documents, any of your shared files, and then if you want to open a specific file that you've saved. So we are going to create a blank workbook. So you can just click the top left here, and then at the bottom right, you can click Create. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the difference between workbooks and worksheets. So you perform the work you do in Excel in a workbook. And by default, Excel workbooks use the XLSX file extension. So usually when you create a new file and you save it and you're already saved files, the extension path will be XLSX. Each workbook can contain one or more worksheets and each worksheet consists of individual cells. And now each cell in your workbook can contain a number, a formula, text that you type, etc. Now let's go over just a general format of your Excel workbook. So you'll notice when you open your Excel workbook, you'll see a bunch of columns with letters. These letters range from A all the way to XFD. So it's about 16,000 columns that you're able to create on Excel. Now you can click a column by the letter and you'll see that the whole column will be selected. Right, likewise, you'll get your row numbers. Okay, so they go up from one to around a million. And if you select a row number, it will select the whole row. Usually at the top of your workbook, you'll get a file button. And if you click on this, it contains options just around working with your workbook, saving your document, opening recent documents, etc. The other thing to note here is your formula bar. So usually if we type in a number in a cell on your formula bar, it will show up as well. And usually when we work with formulas, it will show up here as well. You'll also notice to the left of your formula bar is a name box and the name box shows you the name of the actual cell and we can use it to name tables, etc. Okay. And if you click at the top here, you will notice that there's various tabs and this is called your ribbon. And if you click the various tabs, it will show you some different options. Now, I won't go into too much detail with this because we will cover this in the rest of the course, but usually it defaults to home. And this is where you'll do your normal formatting. So changing your font, changing the color, some conditional formatting, etc. Okay. And lastly, just at the bottom here, this is where you can create new tabs for sheets. Okay. So these are three separate sheets. If you right click, you can rename them, you can delete them, you can insert new sheets, you can copy them, etc. This little icon here is a macro recorder. We won't be using macro recorders in this course, but just in case you want to know. And then if you go to the right here, right at the bottom, this is where you can zoom in and out of your Excel workbook and also change the views. So this is more for printing view and this is a page break preview. So each worksheet consists of rows, which are these and columns. And the intersection of a row and a column is a cell. And the cell is usually named. So for example, the cell here is F9. You can see it at the top here. Now, whenever we click the cell, it becomes active and you can see there is a border selected. And you obviously can also, if you drag, you can select multiple cells. Okay, so I'm going to end off here and in the next lecture, I just want to talk a bit more about our Excel ribbons. And then after that, we'll get into the nitty gritty of Excel. Hi everyone. So this is a quick note about the course. This course is on a project by project basis. The data sets are available in the lecture descriptions, but also there they are below. So if you do want to download all the data sets at once, here is all the data sets that you would need for this course but they are also available in each lecture description. 
I will also indicate what file you need to use when we start a new project in the actual course. Thanks so much. Hi, welcome back. So in this lecture, let's just touch on the famous Microsoft Excel ribbon before we move on to our actual projects, because the ribbon is probably the main part we'll be using in Excel other than the actual spreadsheet. So in about Office 2007, Microsoft debuted the ribbon. And what it was and what it still is, is just a collection of icons, functions, and features of Microsoft Excel at the top of your screen just for easy access. So the ribbon tabs are here, and these are the default tabs whenever you open Microsoft Excel. So here's a quick overview of the tabs. So you have your home tab and you'll probably spend most of your time on your home tab. Your home tab contains some basic clipboard commands. It also contains how you format your cells and your spreadsheets. There's some styling as well. There's conditional formatting. It's where you can insert or delete rows and columns. It's where you can do auto summing, sort and filtering and analyzing data. So there's quite a lot to do here. And all of these icons are generally common tasks that you would do on Excel. Moving to the next tab is the insert tab. So when you select this tab, you need to insert something into the worksheet. It can be something like a table or pictures, shapes, smart art, etc. There's also a bunch of charts, which we'll be doing and even comments, text boxes, word art. Okay, let's move on to the draw tab. So this is where you want to draw on your actual spreadsheets. Most people on iPads or tablets use this, or if they have the stylus connected, we won't be using this too much, but it's pretty simple. It's just if you want to draw and highlight on your spreadsheet. The next tab is your page layout tab. Now this tab contains commands that affect the overall appearance of your worksheet, including quite importantly, settings that deal with printing. Moving to the next tab, which is the formulas tab. So this tab is used to insert formulas. You can also trace dependence, etc., for your formulas and do some error checking, which is quite cool. And we'll be using that. Your next tab is the data tab. This has Excel's any data related commands are on this tab, including data validation, which we'll be using. The next tab is the review tab, and this would contain spelling checks, protecting your worksheet, commenting, etc. The next tab is your view tab and your view tab contains commands that control various aspects of how your sheet is viewed. You can freeze panes here. You can page break your spreadsheet. You can also record macros. And lastly, you have your developer tab. So this tab isn't visible by default. It contains commands that are useful for programmers and we won't be using it in this course. I may add a lecture or two about it later on. Yeah, but that is the Excel ribbon summarized. And in the next lecture, we'll probably start using some of the commands in here. So I'll see you then. Bye. Welcome back. Okay, so we've completed our introduction to Excel. And now we are going to work on Excel. So for that, I've introduced a bit of a project for us to work on. And the project brief or the project summary is in this document called project one.pdf. What you can do is you can open it. It is in the lecture description and I will give it a read. Jim started a business a year ago, which sells clothing specific for taller men. He wants to start getting some investors, but needs to create some sort of reports to show how his sales are. So he's asking for your help. These are his sales for 2021 in dollars. He wants to know the following. What is the total sales for the year? What is the total cost where the cost is 40% of the total sales? What is the total profit where total profit is total sales minus total cost? And what is his profit margin, which is total sales minus total cost divided by total cost. And with that, we can go ahead and open Excel. So I have opened up a blank workbook on Excel. And the first thing we are going to do is save the workbook. So I want you to head up to the top left, click on file and click on save. And now you can save this anywhere you want. I created a folder called Excel course on my desktop and I'm just saving all our projects on here. And we are going to call it Jim's foot. 
and then make sure the file format is XLSX. If ever you do need to change the file format, you can. So there are various formats, but usually XLSX is the most popular one, followed by your CSV. And click Save. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is I want to input the data. So I am going to input it on these two columns. This column can be a month column and this column can be a sales. Now I'm just going to zoom in just so you can see it a bit. So I'm just going to the bottom right here and just moving my cursor a bit. Okay, perfect. Let's start off with A1 and we're just going to type in month. And for B1, we're just typing in sales. If you press enter, it will go to the next row. And now I'm just saying Jan and I'm pressing tab and tab will go across to the next cell. And then sales for Jan is 300. And if you press enter, I'm going to type in Feb, tab, and the sales for Feb is 356. Enter, March, tab, 510. Enter, April, tab, 780. Enter, May, tab, 1023. Enter June tab 2934. Enter July tab 4700. Enter Aug or August tab 7003. Enter. Then September tab 10567. Then we have October tab 12344. November, which is 19,245. And then finally, December, which is 25,893. All right. And then once you input the data, you'll notice if you click on the cell, you'll see the actual values that you've inputted appear on the formula bar as well. Okay, I'm just going to end the lecture here. In the next lecture, we will cover a bit of styling before moving on. So I'll see you then. So let's talk about some styling. So before I start, I just want to zoom in a bit more so we can see. If you go to the bottom right, you should see the scroll bar and you can zoom or you can leave it as is, but I'm just going to zoom so you can see. Okay, now let's talk about some styling. So usually if you want to center your rows or your columns, what you can do is select and drag the columns that you want to center and you'll see in your home tab there is an icon here where you can centralize your text so you can centralize it here or you can center or align it left or align it right so we are going to centralize it perfect you can also bold so if you want to bold maybe a whole column you can click on the column and click bold Similar, you can italics or underline. And then to remove it, you can just click on the icons again. And if you just want to bold maybe a specific row or specific cells, you can just click and drag on the cells that you want to bold and click on B. We can also change our font and our font size. So if we just want to change the font a bit, maybe change the different font style, or different font and maybe make it a bit more smaller we can do that so if you go up here where it says Calibri body you can choose your different fonts here so if you choose a specific font and then same with size so this is at font size 12 and we can change it to be smaller or even bigger you can also use this sort of capital A icons one is bigger than the others and this just changes the font size quite quickly. Then to color your actual cells, so if you select on the cells that you want to color, you can change the color of the font here and pick a color that you like. And then if you actually want a color in the cells as a background color, it's just this full bucket here and then you can just choose any color you want. You can also color this worksheet white. Maybe you don't want to see borders or anything. So if you click on this corner button here and click on the fill bucket and click on white. Okay, now the worksheet is white. So just keep in mind if you have a very big table and you're trying to do this 
it would slow down performance and we can chat about how we can rectify those things later on in the course. The other thing you can do is change or add borders. So if we select our table, I'm just clicking and dragging. This border icon here will actually set your borders. So maybe we just want a bottom border. Okay, and if you click out, now you can see that there's just a bottom border here. And if we select our table again and select on that border icon, you have quite a large variations of borders that you can choose, but I am just going to say all borders. Okay, now if we want to resize our columns, all we can do is select the column we want to resize. So if you want to just resize column A or column A and B, you can just select or click and drag. And then go to the right of any column you want that's selected. And you should see the icon change from a down arrow to two arrows and a bar in between. So like it looks like a crossbar. And then if you change the width, so if you click and drag, you can see it changes both the columns. And then the exact same thing you can do with the rows. So if we click our rows like this, so click and drag all your rows, go to the bottom of any row until that crossbar icon shows up and then click and drag and then your rows would be adjusted. Now you can see when we've adjusted our rows, our text in our cells are sitting at the bottom and we can actually centralize it as well. So if we click our or select our table and where we did the centralize of our text earlier, we can also centralize our text vertically as well. So vertically, I mean here, this space here, and you do it here. So these icons here, you'll be able to centralize your text vertically. The other thing I also like to chat about when we're dealing with formats is that in case you want to clear the formats, so maybe you formatted your sheet and you actually don't like it or someone else has formatted it and you just want to start again from zero where everything is just like you first typed it in in Excel without any sort of formatting, you can do that. So all you do is you select your table, you go to this clear button here, it looks like an eraser icon and click on it and just say clear formats. So clear format will just clear your styling, clear content will clear your cells entirely, including the data that you've typed in. Okay, and now you can see we back to the start and let's just remove the fill as well. So if you click on the corner icon here and go to no fill on your full bucket. Okay, so now we are back to where we started. So while we're here, I actually just want to talk to you a bit more about column formats. Now Excel auto detects formats. It can tell when the cell is a number. It can also tell when your cell is a text. Now, if it's a number, what I'm saying is that Excel knows, okay, this is a number. I can do mathematical operations with it. I can add numbers together. I can multiply, etc. Obviously it's a text. It can't do that. Likewise, Excel can also auto detect dates as well. So a good example for this is that if we type Jan 2022 in any cell you want, so just say Jan space, let's do 2021 because Jim's foot data is based on 2021 data and say enter. You can see it immediately changes what you've typed. And if you click on the cell, you can see at the top here on your formula bar is a date. So it usually just auto detects that date. So if we go to A2, where it says Jan and just say Jan 2021 and press enter. Okay, we can see that it's changed it to a date, which is good for us. And let's click on the corner of that Jan 2021 cell, drag it and drop it to the end until you reach December. All right, and now we have our month column, which is now in the format date. And speaking about the Excel drag function, Excel does that with anything you want. So if we type in, let's just do on D2, the number one, and we click on the cell, click on that corner until your mouse cursor changes to a cross. And if you click and drag, so we can see that Excel has populated that number one. 
We can also do something as on D2, let's type in 1, enter, 2, enter, 3, enter. And if we select 1, 2, 3, and at the corner of the cell with the number 3, click and drag. Okay, you can see now a sequence of numbers is formed. So this is quite easy to do in case you ever need a column where you just need numbers in sequence. Okay, so let's just delete this. And quickly, we're just going to click on column A and column B at the top. And let's just make this center. And I think that's it. I think we can move on to the next lecture. So let's talk about cell references. Now, you may have noticed when we were typing in values into our Excel cells, I told you to type in something in, for example, B4, or to type in something in A6. And those are called cell references. So every cell in Excel has a specific position that you can determine by the column and by the row number. And you can actually reference these in future. So for example, on D2, if I want an exact copy of B2, all I do is on D2, I say equals, and I can type in cap locks B2 and press enter. And now you can see that this cell now references B2 exactly, even to the point of if I change B2, so let's change B2 to 900 and press enter, you can see D2 also changes. And you can do that with every cell. So if we are just going to backspace D2 and say equals again, and now with our mouse, we can actually choose whatever cell we want. So let's just say maybe B10, where it says September 2021, and press enter. We don't need to type it in. We can use our mouse to select a referencing cell. All right, and let's just backspace this. And let's just change B2 back to 300 and type enter. So now that we know a little bit about referencing cells, let's check out some more calculations. So first things first, I want you to clear B14 to B17. And what we can do here is if we do want general calculations like a total sum or even averages, Excel actually has a automated option that you can click and it calculates it for you. And it's called auto sum. So if we click on B14 and ideally I just want the sum of the sales of column B, so I'll click on B14. And make sure you're on your home tab and if you scroll to the right in this area you should have this icon called auto sum and if you click on it okay you can immediately see that excel has included some sort of function here called sum and b2 which is a cell reference colon b13 which is another cell reference and this is actually a formula. So equals sum is a formula. And all it does is that it is summing up whatever values you're referencing. So it's summing up B2. The colon basically means it's a range. So it's saying B2 right until B13. Okay, so B2, which is Jan 2021 sales. B13 is December 2021 sales. It's encased in brackets. Every formula in Excel has a certain specific format that you need to use. And if we type enter, it now gives us that sum. And what's great about this is that if we decide to change a value, so let's change the value for maybe February 2021, B3, and let's just go high. So type in how many zeros you want and press enter. You can see that this immediately changes without you having to do anything, which is great. That's why formulas are there. Okay, let's change that back. So it is, I'm just saying command or control Z to undo. And we're back to 356. If we go back to sales here, I just want to show you quickly what else you can do. So if we're clicking B14, and instead of clicking on AutoSum, click on that small arrow to the right of AutoSum. And here there are other operations you can do. You can get the average. So if we click on average, okay, Excel now uses the average formula, still using range B2 to B13. 
And if we press enter, this now tells us our average sales per month. And then there's other ones. You can do a count as well. This will just tell you the cell count. So if we change that to count and say enter, it's telling you basically that there's 12 months or 12 months of sales. Remember, this will always be formatted in your currency. To remove that, you have to fiddle around with this section here. Again, keeping to B14, if we go back to AutoSum, you can also do the max amount of sales you received in a month. So if we click that, okay, now Excel will find the max sales between this range and press enter. Okay, and it's saying that in, what is it, December, we've reached a max sales of 25,000. And then again, if we go back to AutoSum and click on min, now it will give us the minimum sales which is 300. So back to our auto sum and just sum. Let's leave it as summing up the sales. All right, so in terms of referencing cells, how would we do that for total cost? Remember in the last lecture, I did say that the total cost we're just going to assume is 40% of the sales. Now we don't wanna input it manually where we type in our numbers, okay? Because if I say something like, equals 85655 times that by 40% and enter. And if somehow maybe our November number changes and you know we're just adding a bunch of zeros. As you can see, I'm just gonna make this a bit bigger. Our total cost did not change even though our November sales have changed. That's why we want the formula. So just press Control Z or Command Z if you're on Windows or Mac, just to change your November number back to this old one. And now let's do a cell reference formula. On B15, we're just gonna say backspace. We're going to say equals. And remember total cost is our sales. So I want to take this sales value, B14, click on it. Now we can say multiply by 40% or you can do 0 0.4, press enter. And now it will give us the total cost, which is cool because if we do change something, so again, maybe back to November, let's click on that. Let's add a few zeros. Okay, you can see our sales changes and our cost changes without us having to fiddle with these two. Command or control Z to undo that, perfect. Similar with profit as well. So our total profit calculation would be total sales or sales minus total cost. So to do that, we are going to say equals. Remember when you're working with formulas, always introduce the equal sign. Sales, so we're gonna click on sales, minus total cost. We're gonna click on total cost and click enter or press enter. Okay, so that is our total profit. And then lastly, our profit margin. Okay, remember profit margin is your profit over your sales. Same thing, I'm just gonna scroll a bit up. We're going to say equals, what is our profit, which is B16, divided by our sales, and press enter, and our profit margin is 60%. So this is all done just by referencing cells. Okay, so we seem to be on a roll with cell referencing calculations, so let's continue. The other thing that you normally would do is that maybe at a column level, you wanna introduce some calculations. So a good example of this is that if we want to create a cost column where we calculate the cost per month and we know that cost is 40% of the sales, how can we do that without physically typing this in manually? So let's do that. So I'm just gonna make this a bit bigger. Let's call C1 cost. And just to make it a little bit more neat, let's just make sure it's formatted in the center. So click on column C and click on the format button here to align it in the center. And let's change the currency or the format to currency. So to calculate our cost, which is 40% of our sales, we are going to select C2, type in equals, click on B2, multiply that by 0, 0,4, 
So that's 40% or you can say 40 and then the percent sign and press enter. Now to calculate for February, we can do exactly the same thing. So we can say equals B3, multiply that by 0, 0,4. But that will also take just a bit too long. And Excel has this really handy function where if you click on a cell that has a formula and you go to the corner here, you can see my cursor sort of changes. Let me just zoom in a little bit for you. Okay, you can see my cursor changes and if we bring it down, so if I click and drag down to wherever you want, you can see something happens. So what does Excel do? So when you do that, so when you do that click and drag, Excel will translate the formula. So if you can see the top here, it is translating the formula and it's referring to the correct cell as well. Right? So even though our first one, we refer to B2, when we click and we selected the next cell, it's referring to B3. Okay, so when we drag down, Excel cell references will also move one down. It's quite smart with that. Okay, so I'm going just a bit back. And the shortcut of this is let's just clear everything else other than the first C2 cell. So if we click on your first cell and if you go to the corner here and double click, Okay, so to create a profit column, I'm just going to make the column a bit bigger, column D, going to select it, let's center our text, and let's make sure it is a currency. Let's call this profit, and now in D2, let's select or we'll type in equals, and we know profit is sales, so I'm clicking on sales, minus that by cost which is C2, and press enter. Okay, and that's a profit. If you do it mentally in your head, 180 looks correct. And the same thing we're going to do is we're going to click and drag. And let's check maybe D7, which is sales minus cost of sales. So everything here is looking correct. Okay, so a quick recap is remember that when we work with a formula, and we decide to actually drag our formula down, we know that the active cell will move down. So you can see here it's B2 minus C2. And if I click on my profit cell and move it one down, you can see it changes to B3 and C3. And if I move it horizontally, so I'm going to move D3 horizontally, we can see that it goes C3 to D3. So the active cell moves horizontally as well when you drag. So if we drag it again, horizontally, you can see it's calculating D3 and E3. And this one here would calculate E3 and F3. So just always remember that. Now, before we move on, let's just touch on what happens if we add a new row. So let's just say as the sales manager, maybe I want to add Jan 2022 in here. How would that work? So let's do that. So let's click on row 14 where it says sales and just click on it like that. And you can right click and say insert. And you can see a row just gets inserted above. So let's type in Jan 2022. And for sales, why don't we just write in here 34,421. And what just happened? So we can see that immediately when we typed it in, our formulas for cost and for profit get populated and our sales also immediately change. So if we click on row B15 and go to the top here and just click your formula bar, you can see we're going from B2 all the way up to B14. So it's so much easier to add data and then your formulas will immediately update because even our total profit has updated and our profit margin as well. Okay, and then if we delete it, so if I right click on the row 14 and right click and just say delete, we notice that everything still updates and nothing gets broken, which is good. Let's just undo that. So you can say Control Z or Command Z on Mac. 
or you can click the undo button it should be at the top bar and let's just save that okay so i'm going to end the lecture here in the next lecture let's touch on some formatting just a quick review and then we can move on so in this lecture i just want to cover some formatting because i do think it's quite important so let's just leave this project for now and let's create a new tab so at the bottom here you can see where it says sheet one there is a plus icon let's just click it to create a new tab and let's just double click on where it says sheet two okay and say backspace and let's call it formatting I'm just going to zoom in just so that you can see better okay now let us have three columns and let's say the first column is called raw column B is called format and when you're switching columns you can always press tab and column C is called type and let's just select A, B and C and go to the border of any column but I'm just doing the border of C and let's just increase the length a bit and you can see your selected columns all increase and let's review the main formats in Excel so let's type in for raw 34,4555567 and say enter and what we're going to do is want you to bring it across to B so just click your A2, go to the corner, click and drag it across to B. And now let's format this. So I want you to click B2, go to where it says general, and let's format it to a number. And this would be type number. And let's just select A, B, and C, and let's centralize this just so it looks a bit better for us to see. Okay. So what we know here is that number gets formatted. It takes two decimal places to get 34,46. Now, if you do want to increase the decimal places in your numbers, there is a section here for formatting. You can see that where we decided to choose the number formatting, there are some icons just below it, and these all represent some form of formatting that you can do. And if we go to the two icons, so the one with zeros, and if you click on the left one, you can see it just adds more decimal places based on the number. And if you click on the right one, it removes it. Okay, but the default number format usually gives you two. So what if we put on a three, so what if we type 0 0.5? Also, depending on your location, you may use a full stop or a point as a decimal. Um, I'm from South Africa, so we use commas. So if it doesn't work for you, the formatting correctly, it's probably you need to change the actual decimal from a comma to a full stop. So we have 0, 0,5. And if we're just going to translate that to B3, I'm just dragging that to B3. Let's go back to our format section and let's do a fraction. Okay, and now you can see that this is formatted into a fraction. The other one that sometimes you see is scientific. So let's just write in a four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. And just translate that to be four. Let's press our formatting pane and let's go to scientific. Okay, and you can see this often also pops up and this is now in scientific notation so just in case you ever see long numbers so sometimes you may get an excel file sent to you and you see this and it looks weird so all you have to do to change it back is that you click your formatting pane and you can do maybe number and it goes back okay i'm just going to undo this and on c4 let's type in scientific Another common one is percentages. So on A5, let's just say 0, 0,34. Let's translate that across. Okay, and for percentages, there's usually the shortcut icon here. So you can click on that. Or you can even click back to this formatting bar and go to percentage. It will give you the same answer. Again, if you do want to remove your decimals, you just press the icons on top here. 
that adds and that removes and the default is always two decimal places for percentage I also want to touch on currency as well because you'll notice there's two different formatting for currency so let's type in on a6 1200 and let's just translate this across to b6 let's click on b6 and let's do currency here Okay, defaults to your actual location currency. So I am in South Africa, so that's why you can see rands. But if you do want to change it, maybe you want to change it to dollars. If you click on currency format and go to more number formats, this gives you a bit more customization. So over here, you can choose your formatting. So we want to change from rands to dollars. So go to currency. And you can see it says, okay, we want it with two decimal places, which is fine. If you want it with one or zero, you can change it here. And you can see it shows you how it looks. All right. And then the symbol. So remember, let's just try. Let's do English United States. So that should give us dollars. And here the nice thing is you can also show how you want negative numbers to appear. So if you have a negative number or negative currency, do you just want the minus in front? Do you want it in red? Do you want it in brackets, which is just more of an accounting format? Or do you want it in brackets and in red? Okay, and if you click OK, okay, now our currency is in dollars. So let's just write in currency there. And you can change or customize the format, just like how we've done in currency for all the formats that we've done. So I will show you how to do that with dates because dates is a very common one. Let's do one more currency because this also shows up, especially if you work in finance, the accounting version of formatting. So let's just translate that across. Okay. And let's click on that. And now let's click on this currency sign here. It looks like money and coins. Okay. And this is the accounting format which is a bit more busy. Let's type in accounting. So this is a lot more busy, but obviously if you're in finance or economics, they tend to prefer this format. All right, and let's do dates. So let's do dates. This is quite interesting in Excel actually, because I'm sure if you've been using Excel, you have seen this, but sometimes you'll have a file and you can see the column name will be date, but it appears as a number. So maybe it'll appear like a number like four, four, Eight two three. So this four four eight two three is actually a date and can be translated to a date. Okay, because every date in our human calendar actually represents a unique number. So if that does happen, you actually can translate this into a date. So let's move that across to B eight. And if we say general, and let's just choose a short date. Okay, and you can see the number is actually a date. So if you do get a file where you see numbers, but the column name is actually date, all you need to do is change the formatting and then you should be good to go. So let's call that short date. Now, what you can do is also change how your dates are displayed. So this date here is automatically defaulted to the way that I think the UA system writes it, which is year, month, day. Whereas I'm from South Africa, so we generally do day, month, year. So why don't we bring that across? So let's do 2022-0919. And let's just bring that across to P9. And now let's just change that. So let's go back to our formatting pane on top. And let's just do something like a long date. And let's make that a bit bigger. So this displays date in a long format or a long way. Maybe we want to change that. Maybe we want to have day, day, month, month, year, year. So we can do that as well. So if we click on B9, click on our formatting bar and go to more formats. Okay, and here is where you can actually translate it to common date format. So maybe we want it in year, month, day, which is what we had. Maybe we want this here, which is day and then the month in text and then the year, which you can do. So if we click on that and click OK. But maybe you want it custom. 
So let's click on B9 and let's go to more number formats. And let's do a custom format. So here there are quite a few options that you can do for when it comes to dates. So you can see at the bottom here, I have something called day, day, month, 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 yeah, 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 at. So that is the current format. But what you can do is you can always scroll up and there's quite a few date formats. So this is the one that I usually like, but you can also change it. So this shows day, day, month, 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 yeah, yeah. So it will show something like 20 SEP 2022. But maybe you don't want it separated by dashes. Maybe you want it separated by slashes. You can change that. Or if you wanted spaces, etc. It will show you here how it's going to appear. So maybe we don't want September as SEP. Maybe we just want it as digits. So we just backspace 1M. And here we go. That's how it looks. That's perfect. And let's click OK. OK, let's call that custom date. And those are the main formats that you are going to work with in Excel. I just thought that a separate lecture would be nice just to go over that in more detail. Let's go over referencing cells from other sheets because that's quite important too. So for example, maybe you have some information, some data in other sheet and you actually want to bring it in to your main sheet. We can do that quite easily in Excel. So first things first, rename our tab here at the bottom if you haven't already. So instead of sheet one, let's double click on it. Let's press backspace and let's call it sales data. And now let us create a new sheet. So next to your formatting sheet that we just created in the previous lecture, click on the plus sign. Let's double click on sheet three. In backspace and let's call it business details. Now essentially what I want to do here is I want to type in the owner name, the location and the number of employees in business details. But I want to bring this up into our sales data sheet. Just so that if anyone's interested in that, the information they would need will be all in one sheet. Okay, so let's do that. So let's go back to business details. And I'm just going to zoom in here. And let's make column A and column B a bit bigger. Whatever length you want, that's not too important. And let's just type in A1. Let's call it owner. And then column B1. The owner's name is Jim Green. Let's put in a location. And in column B2, you can write any location that you want. So I'm just going to say Santon City. And A3, let's type in employees. And then let's just type in a number. So let's just say three employees. Okay. Perfect. So we have our business details here. Let's try and bring it into our sales data. So let's go to sales data tab. Let's scroll to the bottom here. Let's create a nice little section called business details. So once you do maybe on A20, if you can select A20 and B20, and let's do a merge and center. So on maybe column A20, let's just type in business details. Okay, and then I can see my cells aren't the same size as the top, so I'm just going to change that. So I'm clicking this corner button here. And what I'm going to do is just click any row and just adjust the height just a little bit, like 29. And now all my cells are the same. Let's just bold business details. And let's type in owner. And then in A22, let's type in location. And then in A23, let's type in employees. So now what I want to do is bring the data from the business details tab into our sales data tab. And I'll tell you a good reason why you should do it. So to do that, we are going to click on B21 because I want to bring in my owners details and say equals. Remember, because we're referencing a cell, cell references a formula. 
when you want to use a formula in Excel, it will have to be a equal sign to start off with. We're going to now still remain in your B21 cell. Go to business details and select B, which is Jim Green. And you can see at the top here, it will actually tell you the sheet that you're on or the tab that you're on. Okay, it's always in quotation marks, the tab that you're on. Exclamation point, which just means that it's referencing a cell that's not in your sheet. And then it will tell you the actual cell, B1. Okay, and if you press enter, you can see Jim Green pops up. So for location, we do the same. So it's equal sign. Don't click out of your cell. Go to business details. And we're going to click on Santon City. You can see this comes up the same and just say enter. And then employees. Equal sign. Business details. Click on B3. And press enter. Okay, now we can see here employees is actually coming out as currency which is incorrect, it's a number. So what do we do? We click on our B23. We go to where it says currency and we change it to number. Let's remove the decimal places because obviously you can't have decimals when you're counting humans. So let's just remove that. Perfect. Now, why is this so important? It is important because if we ever want to change something where you know it's being referenced in a lot of sheets we just have to change it once at the source so if we go to business details and maybe jim has employed another employee or another two he now has five so let's just change b3 to five and press enter and if we go back to sales data this immediately changes now if you're working with one sheet it's fine you can write it in manually but imagine that Jim has 10 different sales data sheets, which goes to 10 different shareholders. Using just one source sheet and changing the details here. And that source sheet is now reflecting on all of these sales data sheets. It just saves Jim a lot of time. Okay. And also the other thing to note is that maybe you have these tabs, which just have source data information but maybe you just don't want people to see them. So you can hide certain tabs. So if we click on business details and let's right click on the actual tab, you can say hide. And now it doesn't show up, but the information still pulls through. So it does make your worksheet a bit neater. Also note that hiding tabs is nothing to do with security. So someone can easily unhide the tab. So if they just right click on the tab here, and say unhide, you can click the sheet that you want to unhide and click OK. So this shouldn't be assumed that only the person who created the worksheet can unhide tabs. Everyone should be able to, so just be careful of that. And also another reminder is that you can color your tabs. So if you right click on the tab and say tab color, you can actually color your tab to whatever color you want. Okay, and you can see the tab changes and if you click off of the tab it looks a bit better so that's nice if you have maybe quite a few sheets in one excel workbook and you just want to color code them a certain way comments and notes on excel are actually a feature that's used quite a lot and i'll tell you the difference between comments and notes soon but basically Let's just say that you are sending this Excel sheet to a bunch of people, but there are maybe certain things that you want to make note of. This is where you can use comments and notes. So for instance, in December, 2021, we have quite a nice increase in sales. Let's just say that the owner wants to note that down. So you can click on your cell, right click and say new note. And usually it will actually tell you who's writing that note, but I don't have my details set up there and you can write whatever you want. So I am going to say sales increased due to full board adverts. Okay. And now we can see that this little red tag is there. And if you hover over it, it will actually tell you the note, which is pretty nice and a good feature.
You can also add a comment. We are going to add a comment here in July 2021. And I've just noticed that I've added the note in the wrong column. I've added it in cost. It should be in sales. So let us remove that. So to remove a note, you right click on it and say delete note. And let's go back here to sales. So B13, right click and new note. In sales due to four volts. Now, if we do want to add a comment, we can. Now, a comment is different to a note. A comment encourages discussion because multiple people can comment on it. So maybe if you're sending the Excel sheet back and forth to a few people and you want their comments on it, then comments are a great feature to have. So let's just have a comment here for the cost on C10. So right click the cell and say new comment. And you can say something like cost is a bit high and send that off. And now if you hover over, you can see that I've commented and I've said cost is a bit high and when I've commented it. Okay. So this is nice because if you're now sending your Excel sheet to your supply manager, she can maybe say, oh, okay, I think the cost is a bit high. And maybe she wants to respond and say it's high because our supplier changed and sending it and now it would have another person's name so your supplier manager and what they have responded and if they send it back to you you'll be able to see that okay so comments encourage a conversation whereas notes are just a note just something for the user to note but still two nice features to have in this lecture we are going to start covering tables on excel now, tables on Excel is an important function of Excel. It's quite an important section. A table is a specifically designated area of a worksheet. So for example, we could change this here into a table. Now you may already think this is already a table. It has rows, it has columns, but tables on Excel are a different format so, because when you select something to be a table, Excel gives it special properties that can make certain operations way more easier and help prevent errors. So the main purpose of having a table is to enforce some structure around your data. So let's see what a table looks like. Let's create a new tab at the bottom. So the plus icon just on the right of business details, you can click it. So just double click on sheet four and call it table. And now what we can do is go to our sales data tab. And I want you to select columns A, B, C, and D until row 15. So until you get sales. And you can say control C or command C. We're going to copy the table. You can also press this button copy here at the top. It'll do that and then go to table and go on to A1 and you can paste it. Now, before we paste it, we can click this paste icon there, but I'm just going to undo that and click on A1. And if we click on that arrow just next to the paste button, there are different ways you can paste things. So a good example is that when you paste something, you can see that our formulas come with it. Now, sometimes you may not want that. And what you can do is instead of just pasting your table as is, you can do something like a paste values. And now you'll notice that there's no formulas at all. Now you can see that all our formatting got erased, which I didn't like. So if we go back to A1 and we click on the arrow, you can say keep source formatting. Okay, so you can see that our source formatting actually got erased, which I don't like. So I'm just going to press undo a few times. And let's just do it again. So let's make sure that we've copying this, which it is copied. Go to table, go to A1, and let us do keep source formatting. Because if we paste like that, our formatting should not be there. So that should retain some of the formatting. So now let's just adjust our column and row height. So let's just click on the corner button here 
and where it says column A, let's just adjust to make it a bit bigger. And for rows, let's just also make it a bit bigger. So go to like row one at the border there and just click and drag. Okay. Now, once your table is on the sheet, we can select any cell in the table. What you can do is you can select it with your mouse. Or sometimes you do get bigger tables. So what you can do is press control if you're on Windows or command if you're on Mac. And just say shift and down. And then hold control or command shift and go right. And now let's convert the selection into a table. So if you click on your insert tab and you can see this icon here that says table. If we click on that. There should be a create table window popping up. And Excel asks you if this range is correct. So it's saying A1 from D15. So that looks correct. And our table does have headers. Headers means name. So we do have column names there. And then click OK. OK. Now there is a shortcut of converting your data to a table. Once you're done with the selection, you can also press Control. T if you're on Windows or Command T as well, just to note. Now, what's great about this, immediately you can see that our formatting has changed. We now have a blue table and you can actually change the format of your table quite quickly. So at the top here, if you click on your table tab and just click on a cell, you can actually see there's quite a lot of options where you can change the formatting quite quickly without you having to do much work. You can choose whatever format you want. I just want to choose a format that makes it easy to see on screen. And obviously you can customize how it looks as well if you want to change the color. Just like how you'd format normal cells, you can do that on Excel. Now let's just discuss the structure of a table on Excel. So remember I told you the column names, they are called headers. So this would be your header row. Sometimes you have a formatting where it creates banded rows. So I'm just going to select, here we go. So this would be banded rows here. So the rows that are filled are banded rows. A lot of people do this just so it's easier to read your table because the bands make it a bit more easier to read and break down the table. You'll see soon enough that we can create other rows as well on Excel, like total rows. And the other thing to note, which you may have noticed immediately is filtering. So you can see these icons here is where you can filter and you can sort, which you can do on a normal Excel sheet. So if we go back to sales data and let's just select our table like that. And if we go to sort and filter and select filter, you can see the exact same buttons appear. So just to note that you can also do it on your normal worksheets. Let's go back to our table tab. And I mentioned that with tables, you can actually create a total row and you don't need to do much work. So let's create a total row here. And I want us to just delete the sales row. So click on row 15, make sure the whole row is selected. And you can click on this delete button here. It's in your home tab, or you can right click also and say delete. So now we have this as a table. So let's click any cell in the table and go to table. And you can see here we have some checklists that can actually be selected. So if we select total row, we can see we have a total row and it will tell us the total profit. Now, maybe you also want a total sales and total cost. If you click on the total cell, so D15 and click on the corner and just drag. It'll give you the total for all three columns. Okay, there are many other things that we can do with tables on Excel. And before we end off our lecture, just a reminder that you can rename your table as well. So you can see on the top left here, it says table name. So we can actually name it to whatever name you want, sales table. And now your table has a name. All right, in the next lecture, I am going to talk about sorting and filtering tables and then using slices as well. But this is a nice introduction on tables. So in the next lecture, I am going to talk about slices as well as filtering tables on Excel. So let's talk about sorting and filtering 
a table on Excel. Now each item in your header row has this icon here, which is a drop down icon that's known as a filter button. And when you click on it, you notice that it displays some sorting and some filtering options, which is pretty cool. So let's chat about sorting a table. Now sorting a table actually rearranges your rows based on the contents and the information of a particular column. So for instance, you may want to sort a table by date, which is pretty common, or maybe you want to sort the table by the number of sales or the amount of sales. So where it starts the month that has a high sales and then descends down. So we click on column B, the filter button here, and it's sort on descending. You can see our table sorts based on the month, which has the highest sales and then it filters and then it goes down to the month that has the lowest sales, which was Jan 2021. Now, depending on your type of data, it can vary. So again, you know, this is a date. So if we do sort our month by ascending, it will sort from January until December. It won't sort on like ascending alphabetically because if it did sort on ascending alphabetically, then we'd have something like April being the first one. So because the format of this is a date, ascending or descending sorting would mean January to December if it's ascending and then December to Jan if it's descending. So you can also sort by color, which is interesting as well. So let's say for instance that we want to highlight our months that have our comments and notes just because they are interesting to note. So let's click on the row, September 2021. Let's go to the full bucket. So make sure you are on the home tab. Click on your full bucket and select red. And let's do the same for December. So select December 21 and select red. And now I want to filter based on my color. So let's just go by month. And now I want to sort based on my color. So I want the red rows to appear on top. So let's sort month and click on that. And let's do by color, cell color. And you can see our red appears. Our table now sorts by color. Now this option is only available if you have overridden the default formatting. These bands here don't really count. It's just if you've had specific formatting or custom formatting in your table. Now that we've done sorting, let's talk about filtering. Filtering a table refers to displaying only the rows that meet specific criteria, that meet specific conditions. When you perform a filter, the other rows are actually hidden. You will hide the rows and the whole row would be hidden. So just a note. So maybe we want to filter specific months. So let's select the month. Again, we can see that it gets separated in the year and then your month, which is pretty cool. So let's uncheck select all. And let's just do January 2021, February and March. Now we can see the filtering happens and we also get totals just based on the answers. So all our other rows have been hidden. We're just seeing January, February and March 2021. And we're just getting the total of that. Now, just a note, you can do that on a normal worksheet. So if we go to our sales data tab, we can also do a filter here. So remember we added the filter. And if we click on the filter icon for month and let's unselect, select all. And let's just say January, February, and March. Okay, we can see that this pops up. We don't have a total row, which is the disadvantage when you just work on your sheet as opposed to a table, which has a automatically updating total row. When you filter on a worksheet, it will just show you what you filtered and nothing else. So why is this showing up? When we created the filter buttons on our normal sales data tab, I selected the table. So if I just go here to the filter tab on top here on your home tab and say clear. To add the filter, what I've done was I just selected this and I did a filter and that's why this won't appear. This would appear because Excel is a bit weird when it comes to filters, just because that there's no row in between sales and total cost, it assumes that this is part of the table as well. 
it's just something to note. But to summarize, we can do filtering on our normal worksheets and on our tables. The advantage of doing filtering on our tables on Excel is that it includes our automated total role, which is nice to have. Whereas in your normal sheets, that isn't included. You just see whatever you filter. Okay, so going back to table. To clear our table, just make sure you select a cell inside the table. Go to your home tab. Sort and filter and say clear. And again, you can also filter by color. So if we want to filter and just show these red rows and nothing else, we can do that. So if we select the month filter button here, and now we're doing a filter, not a sort. So we're doing filter by color. So select that cell color and red. And now we can only see the red rows. To clear it, let's just click on sort and filter in your home tab. Okay, so to clear your filter, make sure you always select a cell in your table. Go to sort and filter and say clear. And now let's just arrange this again, ascending months. So click on the month filter, click on sort, ascending. Now the other way to filter a table is to use one or more slices. And this method is less flexible, but it is better looking. And slices are quite useful when the table will be viewed by maybe people who don't know Excel too well, or maybe you just want someone to come in and be able to filter very quickly. Just because they are quite visual, works well. Also, if you're creating a dashboard, using slices are great. The only disadvantage about slices is that they do take up some room, but let's just see how they look. So before we insert a slicer, let's just change this month format. So I'll click on column A, Insert a slicer, click on any cell in your table, go to table, and then you can see the icon here to insert the slicer. So let's click on that. And now Excel will ask you, well, what do we want to see? What do we want to fault our data by? So let's do month and click OK. And now you can see this pops up. And if we click on a month, you can see it will just show us that month. And if we want to remove that, we can click on this cross filter sign or clear filter and it's removed. Now you can only select one at a time, but if you do want to select multiple, there's this icon here where it says multi-select. And if we click on that and now you can select multiple and let's click clear. We can add more than one slicer. So again, click on a cell in your table, go to table, insert slicer. And let's do something like sales. You can see that this will not come out in a nice format and click OK. And now you can see that with this, the formatting is actually pretty bad because it doesn't make sense. So why would I want to filter my data to just see a particular value? It doesn't really make sense. So slices work well with dimension variables or dimension columns. By dimension, I mean things you can't measure such as names dates, products, etc. It doesn't work well with numerical values, as we can see. Now, if you do want to format your slicer, you can see if you click on your slicer, we have the slicer tab that comes up at the top. And then if we click slice settings, we can change something like the name of it. So month of sales. Whether we do want to display the header, we can have a caption as well, which is more information. And if you click OK. Now you can see that the name doesn't show up here. This is actually the caption. So if we click on slicer settings again and do the same month of sales on the caption and click OK, and now it appears. If you want to, you can also change your formatting of this as well to match maybe your table if you're interested in that. So if you want to align it. Okay. Before we move on, I just also want to note with tables in Excel, you can also remove duplicates. So let's just say that we do have a duplicate. So let's create a duplicate. So on row 14, I want you to select row 14, right click and say insert. And I want you to copy Jan 2022 and paste it here. So 
copy Jan 2022, Command or Control C, and then paste it on A14, Command or Control V. You can just select one cell. And now if we go to our table tab, so make sure you have any cell selected on your table, go to table tab and say remove duplicates. It'll ask you, yes, does your list have headers? It does. So if we're selecting all we're saying here is that it must look for duplicates that have the exact months, the exact sales, the exact cost and the exact profit. Just because in some cases, there may be a case where you just want to remove duplicates that have the same month and you don't care about the values, etc. But here we're selecting to remove any duplicates across the whole row and click OK. And it tells you one duplicate was found and click OK. And now we can see that the duplicate has been removed. So that's quite a nice feature. That is the introduction of tables in Excel. In the next lecture, we are going to do a big section called formulas and functions. Okay, so in the next few sections, we are going to be looking at this data set. And this data set is present in the workbook called project2.xlsx. And this data set represents a company called Style Shop, which is an online shop that sells clothing. It's a very simple data set. We have an order date, so when the order has come through, customer name, so who bought the specific order, the product that was bought, the amount of products that was bought, the selling price just for one product, so if you just buy one shirt, what is the selling price, and similar, the cost price just for one shirt, or one unit. And in the next few sections, we are going to be working with formula and functions. So I'll see you in the next lecture. So in this lecture, we are going to cover formulas and functions, probably one of the most important features of Excel. And before we begin, I just want you to open project2.xlsx. So open that Excel worksheet. As I've said, formulas and functions are probably the most important part in a spreadsheet. You use formulas in your Excel worksheet to calculate results from the data that you've stored in the worksheet. And when the data changes, because data can change, the formulas calculate the updated results and you don't have to put in any extra effort. So obviously this is quite a perk. Now remember, I always say this, but a formula always begins with an equal sign and then contain quite a few elements. They can contain mathematical operators. So for instance, addition, multiplication, etc. cell references, which we have touched on, values, so specific numerical values or even text. And it can also include worksheet functions, which we have also used. Once you have this project2.xlsx opened, go to the working with operations tab. I'm just going to zoom in. And for project two, we are going to have a look at a data set from Style Shop, which is just an online shop that sells clothes. And we are going to be creating some stats for them. And in order to do that, we need to know how to work with mathematical operations on Excel. Let's go through this and let us perform some mathematical operations using formulas. I have this table here. You can see there's column one, there's column two. There's an operation that needs to be done and then the answer. So we are going to type in our answers here. So let's start. So we can see we have column one, which is five, column two, which is 10, and we need to be adding them together. So how do we do that? Remember, we're not going to be typing in any numbers. We are just going to be referencing cells and using mathematical operations. So on D4, we are going to be using a formula. So we are going to say D equals, and we're going to be adding column A4. So you can select column A4 and then plus sign, and then B4. So just select column B4 and say enter. And we get an answer, which is 15, which is correct. Let's do the same for D5. So we have column one, which is 10, column two, which is three, and we need to be doing subtraction. So on D5, press equals, and then select A5. We're gonna say minus B5 equals. Pretty simple. Let's go through multiplication and division. 
So for multiplication on D6, we're going to say equals column A6 multiplied by column B6 and type in enter. And then division. So equal sign on D7. And then we are going to do column A7 slash. So a slash is a divide sign in Excel. Whenever you put an equal sign, a slash is divide in Excel. And then B7, here in this example, we want to say 10 to the power of 2. So we're going to type equals, and then we are going to click on A8. And the little carrot sign, which is that. And we want to say to the power of 2. So it's going to be 10, which is A8, to the power of B8, which is 2. That's exponent. Okay, and now the rest of this is more to do with inequalities. So over here, we're trying to say, how do we do 5 is equal to 5? We're going to type equal sign. And we're going to say A9. Equal sign again. B5. And this should be true because 5 is equal to 5. How do we do greater than? So if we say equal sign. A6. Greater than. Greater than is where the point points to the right. And then B10. And enter. So this should be true. Less than. So equal sign. A11. Less than sign, B11 should also be true. Then we're going to do greater or equal to, so equal sign, A12, greater or equal to, B12, enter. Less than or equal to, equals A13, less than, equal to, B13, enter. And last one, not equal to, equals a14 and then we're going to do a less than and then a greater than sign that represents not equal to and then b14 and press enter and you can see it's true and the cool part of this is that if we change a value so let's just change a10 and let's just make that four and if we change it we can see our answer changes which is a good benefit to have formulas instead of just hard coding your actual formulas in. Always just remember this is maths, so bot maths still exists, order of operations still exists. Okay, in the next lecture, we're going to cover functions. So let's talk about functions. Many formulas that we use actually use worksheet functions. Now, these functions actually enable us to enhance the power of our formulas or calculations and even perform some pretty difficult calculations as well. A function can simplify your formula quite greatly. I'll show you how. So if we go to the Style Shop Data tab, we are in our Project 2 workbook and just head over to the Style Shop Data. And I'm going to scroll to the end here. So let's just say for this column here, quantity sold. If I wanted to create a formula just to sum up the quantity sold and without using any of Excel functions. So on D38, I am just going to say equal sign. And now what I'd need to do is say from the top, I'm going to say D2 plus that by D3 plus that by D4, and do that until I reach the end, which is D37. And that's super long to do. So we can do that, and that works. Or we can use an Excel function. So if we remove that, and say equals, and write in sum, open brackets. And what I can do is scroll to the top here, and just select my column that I want to be summed. So D2 colon D37, close brackets and say enter. It will give me the sum of my quantity sold, but I've used the sum function in Excel instead of adding it up individually. 
So it just makes things a lot more easier. Now, instead of the sum of quantities sold, what if we want to do something like the average? So instead of sum, let's just replace that with average, backspace, and say equals, and type in A, V, E, R, A, G, E. Open brackets, and the same thing. So we can either select our first cell, and then we can do colon, last cell. Okay, so for range, you use colons and press enter, and that is our average. We can do something similar if we want the max quantity sold. So what was our max quantity sold? So instead of average, what we can do is we can just backspace average and say max. Now Excel will look for the most quantity we've sold between this range, between D2 and D37. And it was four. Similar, if we just click back into our cell, instead of max, we can do min. So what was the min quantity sold within that range of D2 to D37? And it was one. Okay. So now let's just delete that. So you can just backspace or delete that cell, which is D38. So now let's practice a bit more. So let's do all of these calculations here across the three cells. If I want totals for quantity sold, I'm going to say equals sum, open brackets, first number, which is D2, colon, remember to range, last number, which is D37, and enter. Now, if I want totals for selling price unit, I just need to drag across. But before I do, what we're going to do is I'm going to freeze this top row just to make it a bit easy for us to see. So let's click on the top row, go to view, and I want you to click freeze top row. So now if we scroll, we can see that our top row freezes, but everything else scrolls, which is perfect. Okay, so to drag it across, I'm going to click on my totals for quantity sold, and I'm just going to drag it for selling price and cost price. Okay, so for selling price one unit, if we click on our E39 and click on the formula bar, it will tell us, okay, it's using this range, which is correct, and it's using the sum. And then this one over here, if you just double click it, it's using the sum between F2 and F37, which is correct. Perfect. Okay, averages, we say equals, average will be D2, which is our first column, so D2, colon D37. And now we just click and drag cross, and we get averages for selling price and cost price. Rounded, how would we do that? Very interesting. So what we can do here is we can do the exact same thing. Now, if we drag this one down, what do you think happens? Is that you can see our starting range for this one starts at D3 because everything moved one down and our end was at D38. So that's not correct. So let's just change that back to D2 and D37. And let's just click and drag that across. Or you want it rounded. So let's just click on and select the three rows. So D41, E41, F41. Go to your home tab and go to where it says general. Let's put in number. And that is the rounded value. Max, so equals max. D2 to D37. Perfect. And let's click and drag it across. And then one D2 colon D37. And drag it across. Okay. So as you can see, we're able to create this table, which has some pretty interesting statistics quite quickly. Can we create it across the three columns, which is amazing. Another common operation, which we covered in the working with operation section is using inequalities, like working with greater and less than. And it often pops up if you are doing any data transformation in your actual spreadsheet. So a good example of this would be, let's create a column where we are going to calculate our profit and then our profit margin. And then I want to know, is our profit margin greater than average? How would we do that? So it might seem a bit complicated at first, 
but it's quite easy to set up. So in the sheet here, we have our order date, customer name, product, quantity sold, selling price, and cost price for each unit. So let's calculate our profit. So our profit, and remember this is just normal sales data from a store. So let's type in column G1, profit. Okay, now in column G2, we are going to say equals, and our profit would be our selling price minus our cost price. And press enter. So let's do that across every row. So to do that, we are going to click G2 on the bottom corner, right? Click and drag it down until the last row, which is row number 37. Great. Okay, now let's create another column. So H1, let's call it profit margin. And that would be on H2, you can type equal sign. And profit margin is your profit, which is G2 over cost F2. And press enter. Perfect. So let's click and drag down. You can either click and drag down or you can select that corner button or you can select the bottom right corner and double click and that should take it across the whole table while we're here why don't we continue our calculations across so the easy way to do it is we can select all three and just go across like that or select one and even go across or we can select all of these so totals, averages, rounded, max and min of your cost price unit. Go to the bottom here, click on it and drag across. Perfect. So now we know that our average profit is 62,9 and our profit margin is 0 0.49, so about 50% average. And now what I want to do is I want to create another column here and I want to know when our profit margin is less than or equal to the average. So let's create another column. I'm just gonna make column I a bit bigger, like that. And let's just say margin greater than average, like that. Okay, and then you can make it a bit smaller depending on the text size. So how would we do that? Essentially, I want to know is this H2, is it greater than our average? And our average is, we can say 0 0.5, so our average is 50%. So this would be yes. The average, the profit we got for this olive green shirt is actually greater than the average. So this should be true. So how would we do that? Well, we would say equals, we're going to say H2. So if this profit margin is greater than Let's scroll down and let's do the average rounded value. So that and press enter. Okay, that's correct. Now what happens if we drag this? So click the corner and drag it one down to apply it to the next cell. I'm going to say false. But let's have a look at the formula. So let's click on I3 and click on the formula bar. Okay, so it's saying H3 is H3, yeah, greater than H42, is that correct? H42, no. So what happened? So remember when we do click and drag, remember our active cell, which is H2 and H41 here, when we click and drag one down, it moves one down. This moves one down, which is perfect, but then also this moves one down, our average, and then that moves to a max value, which is incorrect because our average is constant throughout our data set. So this shouldn't move, but just this needs to move as we move down. So how would we do that? So you can actually fix cells in Excel to be constant, so to not move, to make them static. And you do that by dollar signs. And if you have been working with formulas, I'm sure you see this quite often. We tell Excel with dollar signs, this is a formula, but this specific cell needs to be constant. It can't be changed. It shouldn't move when I'm referencing other cells. It needs to be static. So how would we do that? So let's go back to H2. So our first one, and let's click on the formula bar. So we know H2 is constant, right? Because H2, our profit margin must be greater than H41, which is our average. So that should be fixed. And to do that, you won't be able to sit on the formula bar. So I'm going to work here. 
To do that, I'm going to add a dollar sign before the H and then a dollar sign just after the H. And this basically just tells us or tells Excel to keep it constant. So the dollar sign with the H here is saying that the column must be constant and the dollar sign with the number here is saying that the row number must be constant. And I'll show you how it works. Okay. And if we drag down, so let's just drag down once now. Cool. Let's click on the formula bar to check our reference. So H3, which is perfect, and H41. So now it's still referencing our average, which is correct. And now even if we go more down, and let's do the last one here. So I'm on I20. The kind of formula bar, it's doing H20, which is correct, and still doing H41. All right, now, going back to the dollar sign, what happens if we remove that one dollar in front of the H? Let's see what happens. So nothing will happen here is because our column is always static, right? So we're not moving horizontally, we're moving vertically. So Excel won't change H41, which you can see here. It'll always be at H41 regardless. So that should be fine. But if we move horizontally, you can see it now changes to I41. And if I move horizontally again, it changes to J41. But you can see number 41 stays, but the columns move. And that's because we remove the dollar sign just before the column letter. So if we go back to I2 and we've added the dollar sign just before the column letter, and now let's drag across and we can see H41 is still the same. So H41 in this cell and it's H41 in this cell. And if we do it one more, it's still the same. H41 is here. H41 is here. H41 is here. Okay. Similar, if we go back to I2 and let's remove the dollar sign just before the number. Let's do that. Okay, and the corner of I2, let's click and drag. Oh, something happened. Right, so let's click anyone. So I'm on I17 and just double click it. Oh, now we can see the row changed because the dollar sign means fixing the row in front of the number. And because we've removed the dollar sign, it's now changing because we're dragging down. So that's how the dollar signs work. If we want to fix a specific cell, make it constant, make it not change, we'll need two dollar signs. One to tell Excel keep the row exactly the same, the other one to tell Excel keep the columns exactly the same, the other one to tell Excel keep the rows exactly the same. Okay, and let's just double click on the corner. Let's just backspace those two and let's just double click. So let's just backspace everything. Let's try it one more time. So we need the margin greater than average. So we are going to click on I2 and the equal sign. We're going to say H2 must be greater than our average margin, which is H41. Go back to the top here. And we want H41 to be constant. That shouldn't change, but everything else should. And press enter. And I'll go to the corner of cell I2 and double click on it. Okay, and there we go. We have now a column which tells us if the margin is greater than average, which is good. So similar, we could do profit. So maybe we want to know is the profit actually less than or equal to the average? Let's try that. So let's create a new column called J, make it a bit big. Let's just say profit less than or equal to average. So we're going to say equals, and now we're going to say is the profit, which is G2, less than or equal to, and our average, so I'm just going to scroll down to our average, we can use rounded as well here, scroll back up, G41, enter, okay, and it says false, okay, because 80 is bigger than the 60, what is it, 60, 2, 62 average, great. And now remember, we do want to fix our average because it's one cell. So let's put a dollar sign before the G and a dollar sign after the G, fixing the column, fixing the row, and pressing enter. Perfect. Let's go to the corner and double click on it. 
right now we know if the profit is less than or equal to the average okay so you can see how this comes in use and a good calculation to know later on we're working with a function called if statement and there you can actually change the display of the results so maybe you don't want to say true maybe you want to say yes it is greater than average and you can also do that pretty quickly i'm going to end now and in the next lecture we are going to talk a bit more about working with constants so now that you are getting introduced to functions i thought it might be nice to introduce you to the formulas toolbar which can be very useful. So near your home tab, there should be something called formulas at the top here. And here essentially is a library of all the formulas that are available in Excel. And the nice part here is that you can use a formula, look up the definition, and Excel actually gives you a nice interface on how to input the formula. So I'll give you an example. So if we go to D38, where it says quantity sold and just before our total. And let's just click on autosum. Gives us a nice little autosum. We already know how to do that. But what if we want to do something like an average? We'll give us the average. Again, we already know how to do that. But maybe you want to do something like max. And maybe this time you're not too sure what the max function does. Here, you can actually have a look at it. So I'm just going to backspace D38. And let's go to more functions, statistical. And let's scroll down until we see max, which is here. And if you click on it, you know that Excel calculates this for you. So this pane is just to help you understand the function as well as detail and note how you should write the function so it says the max here and you can either choose a range of numbers or maybe between two numbers or if you want to know the max between three or four numbers you can add numbers as you go and then obviously if you want a range you always note the first cell and the last cell of your column or it can be of your row and it must be separated by a colon and it gives you a nice little definition here of the max function, the syntax or how you should write it. And once you're ready, if you click done, it will tell you the max. So if I wanted to know maybe the max of four different numbers. So let's backspace and let's still work on D38. And let's go over to our formula builder and just double click on max. And when we backspace where it says number one here, and let's just enter a random number. So let's just enter 10. And now let's just enter a different number for number two. Let's just say eight. Let's click on this plus sign. And for number three, let's just call it 52. From the plus sign, number four, let's just call it 11. And now what I'm telling Excel is that I want the max of these numbers. So between number one, number two, number three, and number four, which one is the highest? And if we click done, okay, you can see on a cell D38, it tells me 52, and it also gives me the result here. If you're ever stuck, you can definitely use this as a form of helping you input a function correctly. And it also gives you a definition. So if you do get stuck and you're not too sure what this function does, you can always go to the formulas bar, click on insert function. This formula builder should show up and you can search for it. The other thing I want you to note is that we do have something over here called trace precedence and trace dependence. And what this does is it actually tells you if you do click on a formula, what cells make up that formula. So if we click on D40, which is the averages for quantity sold, and we click on trace precedence, it actually tells you quite nicely in a visual way what cells make up that formula. And if we do have any other formulas or cells that refer to maybe the averages formula, if we click on trace dependence, it will tell you 
if there's any cells that depend on this specific cell here. So if we click on trace dependence, here it says that, hey, there's nothing that depends on this, which is correct. But if there is, it will show us as well in this similar format. Okay, and then to remove it, you just click remove arrows and it gets removed. So that's something as well that's quite neat to use. So again, let me just give you an example for dependence as well. So if I just place on D45, I'm going to say, let's just say 100 times the average, which is D40. And press enter. Okay, so on this here, if I click on D45 and let's click on trace precedence, you can see it tells me that this cell is in D45. So, which is true, we just saw the calculation, it's 100 times D40, and that makes sense. And if we go back to averages, and let's say trace dependence, and now let's click remove arrows, and let's go back to averages, so D40, and click on trace dependence, Okay, we can now see that the cell desired profit margin, D45, depends on averages, which is good. Now, this is actually quite useful if you have a spreadsheet with lots of formulas and the formulas rely on each another. And just in case you may delete a formula, you don't know what other formulas are affected. So this definitely comes in handy. So now I wanted to touch on working with dates just because it can get very complicated and I thought maybe we can do a slight introduction now. In this lecture, we are going to have an introduction to working with dates. Now later on in the course, we will expand on that. So in this lecture, we are going to do a small introduction on dates on Excel, which is quite a big topic and we will expand on dates a bit further in this course. But I thought now is a good time just to introduce working with dates and two common formula that we use. Looking back at project two, we still have our data for project two. And what we're going to do is look at this column, which is order date and create two new columns. So the two new columns we are going to create is weekday. So what weekday does this specific order date fall under? And then similar, what week number does this order date fall under, which is very easy to do on Excel. So to start, let's create a new column. So select column B, right click and say insert. Perfect. And now before we start, let's just make sure that the column format is fine. So I want you to click home and just make sure you're clicking on any cell. And we can see here that it says custom format, which I don't want. So let's click on column B and let's just change that to number. Okay. And we're doing that because the weekday does get outputted in a number. So if it's one, it means Monday. If it's two, it means Tuesday, etc. So let's name this column weekday. The first formula we are going to use is the weekday formula. So in introducing a formula, you press equal sign. Going to say weekday, and you can see this comes up. Open brackets, and now Excel tells us our serial number, which is a fancy way of saying our date, and then the return type. So our number or serial number here would be our order date, which is just A2, which you can just click on it. Semicolon and your return type. So your return type is how do you want the day to start? So is day number one, does that represent Sunday or does that represent Monday? So the most common examples here in Excel gives you a few different return types, but it's always one whether your day starts on a Sunday or two if it starts on a Monday. So I'm going to say one, which means that when it says weekday equals one, I know that's a Sunday close brackets and press enter. Okay, so you can see 1 Jan 2022, it says the weekday is seven, which means it's a Saturday. And if you do check it on your calendar, you'll notice that 1 Jan is indeed a Saturday. 
And the usual thing we're going to do is we want to apply it across our worksheet. So click on your cell B2. Go to the end until A cross forms. So the bottom right and double click. And now we have the weekday. Now that's how you do it through a formula. And as you can see, it's in a number format. Now there is no way that we have a formula that will give us a direct output that is a weekday name, like Monday, Tuesday, etc. But you can actually change this to weekday names, either using formulas, or you can actually do this without using formulas at all and using formatting, which is what I'm going to show you quickly as well. So let's create another column. So select column C, right click, select insert. And let's call this column weekday name. Let's just make it a bit bigger. And what I want you to do is I actually want you to copy the date and order date and paste it in column C. So what I like to do is hold command if you're on Mac or control if you're on Windows. So command or control and shift button and then the down button. So that should select the column from the beginning to the end. And you can say command or control C to copy. And on C2, you can press command or control V to paste. Okay, so now that we've pasted our information here, let's select column C. And now we are going to change the formatting. So to do that, we can go to the top here by a format bar and go to more formats because we are going to do a custom format. It's part of our date, so let's just have a look at date and see what's available. Okay, we can see that we have different types of dates, but we don't just have a format where the weekday is just showing up. So we don't just have a format that just shows the weekday and nothing else. So let's go to custom. Let's have a look here. No, we still can't see it. Okay, that's fine. Let's create it. So we know that day day gives us a number. So on type, I want you to backspace everything and let's just say day day and click OK. Now you can see that the weekday name shows up. So it's a bit of a interesting way to do things. But if you just want a shortcut to do this, then this is probably your best way. If you don't mind seeing the weekday in a number format, then you can use the function as well. In a same fashion, let's calculate week number. So order date is in one year. What is the week number? It should be week one. But what is the week number 15 Jan, which should be week three? How would we do that in a formula? So let's create a new column. So where it says column D, click on it, right click and say insert. And let's call this column week number. Let's start with D2 and say equals. And the function we are going to use here is week number. Very similar to weekday. If you open your brackets, you'll see it starts with the serial number, which is just your input date. So let's do A2 and then your return type. Semicolon and then your return type, which is same reasoning I gave previously. You usually work with one or two. So one is where the week starts on the Sunday. Two is where the week. Two is where the week starts on the Monday. So I am going to say one for Sunday. Close brackets. Enter. You can see we still have the old formatting from here. So let's just click on column D. Click on our format bar on the top here, and just say general. Okay, that looks a bit better. All right, and once we're ready, click on D two. Click on the corner until you get that cross, and double click. And there you have your week number. Now that we know a bit more about functions and formula, let's talk about errors because this is something you'll definitely see in your Excel journey. Now, Microsoft Excel has different ways of displaying different errors. And I'm going to go through the top few with you just so you understand what each error value means as well as what to do with it. So if you do want a list of errors, in your project two Excel workbook, there should be a tab called type of errors. And I've just listed the common errors and a brief explanation, but we are going to have a look at these errors in a more practical view. 
Now I'm sure you've seen some of these errors pop up if you have used Microsoft Excel and sometimes they can be quite annoying. So it's always nice to know what the error is and what you can do to fix it. The first error is quite easy. It's a divide by zero. So whenever you see this error, you know that somewhere along the line that you have divided by zero. This could also mean that maybe a cell in one of your formulas have no data or no values in it and you are dividing by that cell. It will also cause a divide by zero error. So to see it in action, we can just say equal sign and I'm looking at G47 where it says divide by zero and let's say one slash or divide by zero and press enter. Okay, that's my errors. I'm just going to write on F46. Errors and I'm just going to bold it and maybe fill that cell with any color that you want so at the top here on your full bucket so you can see it a bit better. Now this error pops up when you essentially make some sort of spelling mistakes with your formulas or your function. So we know that for instance equals sum open brackets and let's just sum anything like that close brackets is a formula. But what if by mistake you type in SU and press enter? You would get a name error. And that means that you have made a spelling mistake and you need to fix it. What about the NA error? Now, this error is a bit more rare to see. You usually see it when you use things like VLOOKUP and MATCH, which, if you don't know about your lookup functions, basically they enable you to search through a list of values and find a specific value that you're looking for. If Excel doesn't find a value, sometimes it returns in a. The other time you'll see it is when you use it in a function. If you're working on a formula and if there's no value and if you want Excel to return in a, so if you just type equals in a, open brackets, close brackets, enter, it will display in a. Um, error is another error that can pop up and this is when you specify a number that is supposed to be positive but it's negative and vice versa. So a good example of this is square root. We can't square root negative numbers that doesn't exist. So if we try that on Excel, so let's go to G50 and type in equals. The function for square root is SQRT, open brackets, and let's just type in negative one, close brackets, enter. Okay, it will tell you hashtag num, explanation mark, it's an error, this doesn't exist. So it will give you a num error because it doesn't exist. The square root of a negative number doesn't exist. The other error that you probably see quite a lot is your ref errors. Now, ref errors are where the formula refers to some cell that doesn't exist or isn't valid. And this can happen usually if you delete a cell in your worksheets. So here's an example. On E53, type in 2, enter. And on E54, typing 4, enter. And on E55, type in 5, enter. And in your ref row, in G52, I want you to say equals. Let's click on E53, add a plus sign, click on E54, add another plus sign, and click on E55. Press enter. Okay, so that's a proper formula. But let's just say if we delete this row, so let's delete E55. Okay, you can see we get a ref because the cell doesn't exist anymore. And then lastly, you get your value error. So this is when the type of your data or your cell is wrong. So a good example here is maybe you want to change a float or a decimal. So a good example is maybe you want to change a decimal or float like this, like your averages, to an integer, which is just one value. It's either two or three and you call the integer function. So if you go to G53 and say equals INT, open brackets, but now by mistake, we select a text. So let's just select F50. But now by mistake, we select a text. So let's select F43, which is max. Okay, and it's a word max. Close brackets, enter. And as you can see, we have a value error because max, can't round a word, can't change a word to an integer, so it gives you a value. That is just a brief introduction on errors on Excel, and those are the most common errors on Excel.
The other thing I do want to make note of is that if you go to your formulas bar over here, there is something called error checking. And this is quite useful if you have a lot of errors in a spreadsheet. If you click on error checking, Excel will tell you where the error is, what the actual error is. And if you need more help, you can click on help on this error. You can say trace error, ignore error, if you just want to completely ignore it and move to the next one, or you can even edit it in the formula bar. The other thing to note while we're here is that you do have the option to show formulas, which actually comes in handy when you are looking at errors. So if you click on show formulas, which is next to error checking, now this will just show all the formulas in your workbook instead of the values. And to remove this view, if you just click again on show formulas, it goes back to normal. That's just a brief introduction about errors. Let's talk about using name managers. Now, name managers can make your formula a lot more easier to read and understand, especially if you're sending your spreadsheets to different stakeholders. Often it's hard to click on a formula, have a look and see, okay, so now they need to scroll to K41 to see what exactly are we comparing K3 against. And if you scroll down, you need to look for K41, which is here. And then you finally realize, okay, this is the averages for your profit margin. So it would be nice for these kind of formulas if we could have names here, just so we can understand a formula just by looking at it instead of having to track back, which can waste a lot of time. So that's where name managers actually come in handy. So this would be a nice case for a name manager because this is a constant value. We are just using the average of the profit margin in this column for all of these. And it would just look better if instead of this, which is your cell ID, we can have some sort of name. So how would we do that? If we go to our formulas bar and select name manager, and now we are going to select a new name and let's call it average profit margin. The scope can be applied either through the whole workbook. So in every tab that you create this here, you can use this name anywhere, or if you just want it for a specific tab or a specific sheet. You can write a comment about this. So let's just say this is the average profit margin. And what cell does it refer to? I think we're doing profit margin down here and make sure we have average. We can use an average around it. So it's K41 in your style shop data tab. Column K row 41 and click OK. Perfect. And now we can use it in our formula. So if we go to L2, which is here, and double click and just backspace that and go use in formula average profit margin yeah, and enter. And I'll click on L2 again, go to the bottom right and double click. And now when you click on it, you can see that instead of K41, we actually have a nice name that makes it a lot more easier to understand. Okay. If you go to the row to the right, this doesn't, this just says J41. So to implement it on J41, which is just our average profit, we do the same thing. So we can go to name manager on the top, go to new. It's called average profit. We can apply it to the whole workbook. Let's write a comment in average profit. Okay, and then make sure that it is the same range. So you can click on this white cell here, over here, click on your cell. And then if you go back to your new name and click on the white cell, it will go back to this window and click OK. Click close. And now on M2, we're going to double click M2, backspace J41, click use in formula and click on average profit and say enter. Click on M2 again, go to the bottom right and double click. And now you can see that when we click our formula on column M, it will tell us average profit. So definitely a good way to make your formulas look a but more neat, especially if you are using constant values like average profit and average margin, 
that maybe get used quite a lot in your Excel workbook or your sheet. Another useful function that a lot of people use on Excel all the time is the round function. And we have worked with rounding numbers before, but we've done it through the formatting method. So still sticking to project two, our sales data. If we look at D40, and if we look at D41, these are the same. But if you remember, we did round this via changing the format to be a number. But what if we want to use a function or a formula? Because what happens is that if we somehow clear the format, which you can do, sometimes the cell goes back to its default format. So an example of this is that if I select D41 until H41, and if I go to the top over here, there is this erase marker. And if we click on clear and we say clear formats, okay, you can see that the cell goes back to its default value, which isn't great. So we can use a function because a function doesn't rely on formatting and function will always stay there. Even if you have to change the format of your worksheet, etc. it will always stay there unless you change the actual formula. So to use the round function, we are going to still stick to this row here on D41 and type in equals. And now just type in round open brackets and what value are we going to be rounding? So we are going to be rounding D40. So you can click semicolon and how many digits do we want the number rounded by? So let's just do two decimal places for now. Close your brackets and enter. Perfect. And let's drag it until H41, which should be our profit margin column. So click on D41. Go to the corner of the cell and just click and drag it until you reach H41. Perfect. Now, what if you do want to round, but you don't want to refer to this formula here? So you want to type in your average formula and then round that value. How do we do that? That's known as nested formulas, where you have multiple formulas inside formulas. And it may sound complicated, but if you know what you're doing and you break it up, it's actually quite easy. So let's start again. So let's work with D41. Let's backspace and let's type in equals. And let's do average. Open brackets. And let's select our range. So I'm going from D2 all the way down to D37. Close brackets and enter. Okay, so you can see these two values are not the same, but now we're going back to D41. We are double clicking it. And just before average, let's type in round, open our brackets, and now encase this average formula here in those round brackets. Okay, so now we round is actually rounding the average. Now, if you press enter, it's going to give us an alert saying that there is too few arguments, which we should not, because remember when you use the round function, you need to indicate the number of decimal places. So let's backspace one bracket here. Let's click OK. And let's just backspace one bracket there. Okay, now we can see Excel is telling us, OK, we've done the number, which is the average. Semicolon, our number of digits is two. And close your brackets. So we are rounding this, which is the average of the specific range, by two decimal places. And now you can see what I mean, how it looks complicated. But if you actually break it down, it's not too bad. Press enter. Awesome. Now that we have it here, let's apply it across. So let's click the bottom right of the cell and just click and drag it across. Perfect. And now we can see, if we click on every row, that this formula now references average. Just to make it neat, let's just click on that row and let's centralize it. Perfect. I'm just going to click the Save button. Cool. So we're on to a new section. And in these next few lectures, we are going to be working with text. 
which is pretty cool in Excel. Now, before we start, I just want to introduce you to Project 3, which is a different data set. And the data set is in the workbook project3.xlsx. Now, the data set here is just simple review data from a company. So this company sells clothes and they have an Excel sheet with all the customer reviews. So this data set has a first name, a last name, an email, which is blank, but will populate it, the age of the customer, the payment, the review, the division name, so probably the division that the clothing item belongs to, the department name, the class name, the rating that the user gave it, and it is out of five, whether or not the user recommends it, and if that review got enough likes. So if you think about it, like on Amazon, when someone leaves a review, other people can come and like it. So that's a data set. And in the next lecture, we're going to be working with text and transforming it. Okay, so in this lecture, we are going to be working with text. And handling text in Excel is quite a useful feature to know. And handling text in Excel is quite useful knowledge. You are always going to come across a scenario where you need to merge cells or you need to separate cells. So this was quite important. So let's start by merging cells. An example here would be we have a first name and we have a last name that's separated in two different columns. What if we want to create one column that has first name and last name? We can do it quite easily with Excel. So I want you to click on column C and let's create a new column called name. So when you click on column C, right click and say insert. Let's click on column C again. Let's make the column a bit more wide. And let's call this column on C1, double click and call it name. Now in order to merge first name and last name, there's two different ways we can do it. So the first way is using ampersand. And technically it's not a function, but it is still a formula. So I'm going to show you how to do that. So for ampersand, we are going to say equals on C2. Let's select our first name, which is A2, Omar. And now we need to separate it by a space because I want to combine first name and last name separated by a space. So it'd be Osma space Goodspeed. So we have A2, which is Osma. Now we need a space. So I want you to open quotation marks, type in space, close quotation marks. And in Excel, whenever you type in text, so characters, strings, letters in your formula bar, you are always going to need to enclose them in quotation marks. That's just how it's done in Excel. Okay, so we have our space. Let's put in another ampersand and let's bring in B2 and press enter. Right. Let's go to the bottom right of C2 until the cross forms and double click it. That's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is through a formula called text join. And text join is nice because if you want to merge quite a lot of cells, you don't want to continually type in ampersand and a separator and then ampersand again, you know, if you're trying to merge 10 or 15 cells. So text joint makes the whole process a bit more easier. So let's go back to C2. Let's backspace. Let's type in equals and let's say text join, open brackets. Now, what is our delimiter? So our delimiter is a space, but I actually want to show you how it looks with commas. So our delimiter is a space, but just for the purpose of this exercise, let's just put it as commas. So again, quotation marks, comma, quotation marks, semicolon. Now we have something called ignore empty. Ignore empty basically tells Excel what to do when it comes across an empty cell. So, so if it comes across an empty cell, does it still put a comma or does it just ignore it? So for the purpose of this exercise, let's just put in true, where it means that it must ignore empty cells. So it won't place a comma if there's an empty cell. We'll just have the first cell. 
So we're going to say true, but you can actually see that prompt in action when we change it a bit later on to false. But let's just leave it now for true. Semicolon. So our text one is actually going to be A2, which is Osmo. And our text two is going to be B2, which is good speed. But as you can see here, you can go on and on. And you don't need to put any additional and percents. You don't need to put any quotation marks. But you don't need to put any additional ampersands or separate it by spaces or commas because we've stated it in the beginning. So it's a bit more easier to develop this formula than to do the first method where we separated everything by an ampersand and by the space. Okay, we are going to close brackets and press enter. Perfect. So again on C2, let's go to the bottom right and double click. Okay, and then you can see that Cloris doesn't have a comma because her cell was empty. Excel ignored it. So, with that being said, let's go back to C2. Let's double click C2. And instead of true, let's change that to false. So now we're telling Excel not to ignore the blank cells and put a comma instead. So let's press enter. Go to the bottom right of C2 and double click when you get the cross. Okay, and now you see Chloris has a comma, which we obviously don't need because it is a name. So once again, let's go back to C2. Let's double click. Let's separate this by a space. So instead of comma now, let's separate this by a space. And instead of false, let's say true, because we do want Excel to ignore the empty cells. We don't want random spaces appearing. We just want a space in between first name and last name if there is a last name. Okay. Close brackets, enter, that looks much better. And then on C2, let's go to the bottom right and let's just double click. Perfect. And that is how you join cells together. So now that we have covered merging cells, let's cover separating cells. And I am on project three. And if you look at the separate text tab in the bottom, and if you click on it, you'll see what I'm seeing. And if you've worked on Excel before, this is common. Lots of people open a spreadsheet and they'll see something like this, where the text isn't separated or it's separated by some sort of character, which is known as a delimiter, like a comma, which is exactly what you're seeing. And in Excel, you can separate this into columns quite quickly. And again, there are two different methods that you can use. So because we are going to do it two different ways, I want you to actually duplicate the spreadsheet. So click on separate text at the bottom, right click, go to move or copy, and just click on create a copy and click OK. Perfect. This may get created just before your data tab. So you can click on the separate text to tab and just drag it maybe after the original separate text tab. So now we have two tabs. Okay, selecting any one of these tabs, let's figure out how we can separate them. So let's click on column A. And the first method we are going to do is Excel's text to columns. So if you click on column A, click on data. Before we click on text to columns, the only requirement you have is just make sure that the next few columns are blank because it will overwrite whatever data is in the next few columns. Okay, and when you're ready and you've clicked on the data tab on top, click on text to columns here. Okay, now Excel opens the convert text to columns wizard. So this is where you can choose whether you want to separate it by delimited, which means a value or character. So which means that your cells or your columns are separated by a specific character or value. So for instance, comma, slashes, spaces, etc. But you can even separate it by a fixed width. So these are fields that are aligned in columns with spaces between each field. But because we know that this is actually separated by a comma, we are going to select delimited. Click next. And now you can choose what is the delimiter. So is it a tab? Is it a semicolon? It's a comma. And when you select on comma, you should see an example of how it will be separated, but basically it can be anything. So if it's a slash, you can just put it in here. 
but for now it's just a comma. And if you do want to treat consecutive delimiters as one, you can select that. So if you do have something like empty cells, is it treated as one or treated as two? If you have empty cells, we have two commas. You also have the option to treat consecutive delimiters as one, which we're not going to select. And click on next. Over here, you can actually get the option of selecting the type of each column, which is quite cool. But for now, we don't really need that. And when you're ready, click on finish. And now you can see that each column Let's just make column D a bit bigger. And column E is now separated. The other method we can use is actually by a formula. So with that, let's go to the separate text two tab. Okay, let's click on B1. Let's press equals. And now the function we're going to use is called text split. Open brackets. What text are we splitting? We are splitting this. Semicolon, what is our delimiter? So remember, we put our delimiters in quotation marks, so open quotation marks. It's still a comma, so everything looks like it's separated by a comma. Close quotation marks. And you can just end it there. If it's a simple one like this, you just need to end it there. You can have options like if it was a row delimiter, if you're going down, you'd put a row delimiter in. You can ignore any empty cells. You can choose your match mode, etc. But most of the time, you just need to put the first two options. Close your brackets and press enter. Okay, and now you can see our columns are separated. Okay, to drag it down, we just click on B1. So your first cell where you inputted your actual formula. Go to the corner of B1, the right bottom corner, and double click. Go to the right bottom corner of B1, and you can just click and drag. Okay, and everything now is split. If you want to get rid of this column here, just remember to select your columns, do a control or command C, go back to B1, go to home, go to paste, but don't just paste it as is. Click on the small arrow to the right of paste and click on paste values. So now this gets rid of our formula. If you click on each cell, there's no formula. And that means that we can just delete this column A. Okay. If we delete the column A without pasting just values, this here will all have the ref error. Okay, you can see that this often comes up when it's a text and it should be a number. So if we click on C2 and just highlight from C2 right to the bottom, so what we can do is we can press Control if you're on Windows or Command if you're on Mac, Shift and Down. Okay. And if you just wait a bit, there should be an exclamation icon that pops up. If you click on that and it says, hey, this number is stored as text. If you click on convert to number, this gets converted to a number. Let's just save while we're here. And that's how you separate your cells based on a delimiter. In this section, we are going to be covering our lookup formulas. This includes VLOOKUP, HLOOKUP, and XLOOKUP. So the first question is, what is a lookup formula? And you'll find that the scenario is something that you'll come across quite often. A lookup formula just means finding a specific value in a list of other values. So a good example is that I am on my project3.xlsx file, and I'm on my data tab. Sometimes in Excel, you want to search for specific values in a column or in a row. And sometimes you maybe want to search for a value and output a relevant value to that value. So what I mean is that maybe we want to find the first name of the last name Conrad. So that would entail us going through the list, looking for the surname Conrad, and then outputting the corresponding first name, which is Saxon. Excel can do that using lookup functions, and we are going to go through each one of them. So let's start with the VLOOKUP. In your project3.xlsx, you can go over to the lookup tab at the bottom. I'm just going to zoom in. And let's start off with VLOOKUP. VLOOKUP stands for Vertical Lookup, and it is a function that makes Excel search for a certain value in a column. 
This is often called array. And in order to return a value from a different column in the same row, okay? So an example is that maybe I want to find the sales amount of cherries, okay? So what I would do is look for cherries in our type table and then output this corresponding row. And that's what VLOOKUP does. Now, if we go into the VLOOKUP formula, so if we go to B1 and type in equals, and let's type in VLOOKUP, let's have a look at what we need to input. Open brackets, and now we can see what exactly we need to input here. So the VLOOKUP function consists of four components. The first one is the lookup value. So this is a value that you want to look up. So in this case, what I want to find is a sales amount for cherries. So cherries would be my value. It then needs us to input the table array. This is a range in which we want to find the value and return the value. This is a range of the table that consists of the lookup value as well as the value that we're finding. We then need to input a call index number. And this is the number of the column within our defined table or our defined range that contains the value that we're looking for. So return value means the value that we're looking for. Lookup value means the value that we're using to get the return value. So call index number basically means the number of the column that contains our return value. And lastly, we need the range lookup. Zero means false, which is an exact match, which is usually what we use. And one or true, which is an approximate match, where we may look for something similar. So using that definition, let's try it out. I want to pull the sales amount for cherries, and it is in this table. Now, in this example, yes, it's obviously quite easy, and you'd be able to do it manually. But if you imagine that this table consists of thousands of rows with thousands of different types, it becomes harder to manually search just for cherries and you would want to do it in a formula. So on B4, let's type equals and let's type in VLOOKUP. Open brackets, our lookup value, which is cherries, semicolon, our table array, which is A7 all the way down to A10 and then the other side as well. So it would be A7 to B10. Semicolon. Our column index number. So what column number has our actual return value? And it's column number two because one is type and two is sales. So we are going to type sales. And lastly, our range lookup. Do we want true and approximate match or do we want false and exact match? So we are saying we want false. Close brackets, enter. Again, we have that. So cherries is 54509. And the great part about this is if we change our B3 value. Okay, and here's our answer. The sale amount for cherries is 54,509. Again. Going over the formula, our VLOOKUP formula, we have B3, that's the lookup value. That's the value that we're using to find our return value, to find the value that we're actually looking for. So B3 is cherries. Then we need to input our table array, which is where our lookup value belongs. So where cherries belongs and where our return value belongs. So that would be A7 to B10. We then need to tell Excel what column does our return value belong in. It belongs in column two. If sales was in column C, it will belong to column three. And lastly, if we're looking for an exact match or a approximate match, and in this case, it's an exact match, so it would be false. And that's V lookup. Now, maybe you want to return the sale amount for oranges. So on B3, if we just type in oranges and press enter. Okay, it will return the sale amount for oranges. And that's how you do VLOOKUP. So we know how to do VLOOKUP. What about XLOOKUP? XLOOKUP is the newest member of the Excel lookup family. So very similar to VLOOKUP and HLOOKUP, except that XLOOKUP, you are capable of using it 
for data horizontally through rows or vertically in columns. It's also a better performing function, which means that it doesn't slow down your workbook as much as VLOOKUP and HLOOKUP. So in essence, XLOOKUP allows us to search for an item in a range or a table and return a matching result. So very similar to VLOOKUP. And with XLOOKUP, we just need three parameters. We need the value that we're looking for, the list where this value should be found, and another list from where you want the results. And I really do recommend using XLOOKUP instead of VLOOKUP or HLOOKUP. So let's see it in action. So in project three, back to our data tab, I have a blank column for emails. And ideally what I want to do is populate this table with emails. However, my email addresses actually sit in a separate sheet. So if we look at the tab emails at the bottom, this is where my emails sit with the corresponding names. Now, all of these names are mixed up, so I can't just copy the email address here and paste it to my data tab. If I was going to do this manually, what I would have to do was look for the name Osmar Goodspeed, go to my emails, look for Osmar here, which is down here, copy this email address, and then paste it here so it will take long. But we can actually do this pretty quickly using XLOOKUP. So let's use XLOOKUP. So in your column D, on D2, let's type in equals and type in XLOOKUP. Open brackets. Now we need our lookup value. So our lookup value is going to be C2. We're looking for Osmo Goodspeed. Our lookup array. So where would we look up this value? So we go to emails and this is where it would be. So we can go to two. So click on two and you can see at the top here, we still maintain that same function. If you click on A2 and press control if you're on Windows or command if you're on Mac. So control or command, hold your shift button and press your down arrow. Perfect. So it should say A2 to A51 at the top which is great because we know that we would find the name in this column. Semicolon, our return array. So where would we find the email? Where would we find the return value? So we would find the return value in this column. Okay, so staying on the sheet, I want you to click on B2 and you can see it populates here, the top here. And then hold control if you're on Windows, command if you're on Mac, shift and down again. And now the top here should populate with emails, explanation mark B2, colon B51, which is great. Semicolon, what should we display if the email isn't found? So this, you can put whatever you want. So in quotation marks, because remember, if we are going to be writing any text, any strings, any words on Excel in our formula bar, it needs to be quotation marks. So let's just say if nothing is found, Excel must just output the words not found in quotation marks and then our last one we can do is our match mode so you have four options here we have zero for an exact match negative one if you want an exact match with the next smaller item one if you want an exact match with the next larger item and then two if it's a wild card character match so we just want an exact match and then you can have the option for search mode how would you search for it whether Excel should search first for last, last to first, etc. In most cases, you won't really need that. So close your brackets after you type in zero for an exact match and press enter them. So that is correct. Let's move one down and let's see what the formula does. So go to the bottom right of D2 and click and drag it one down. Let's look at the difference between the two formulas. So formula D, we have C2, Look up value. All right, so for D2, and I'm just moving in between D2 and D3, I can notice there's quite a lot of changes here. So remember all the cells are referenced in D2. If we drag one down on D3, everything will move one down, which is fine for the lookup value because the lookup value will move one down. But the rest of the formula should actually stay static because our table arrays shouldn't move one down. And you can see here that everything's moved one down. 
So if you click on your formula bar, just to make it selected and make everything highlighted, go to emails. So if you click on your formula bar, you can notice that it's referring to emails from A3 to A52 as our lookup array, which if we go to emails, it's saying that our lookup array starts in A3 to A52, which is not correct because we should actually include A2. And that would also mean if we go back to data and let's click the bottom right of D3, let's click and drag it down wherever you want to. So I'm looking at D20, Randall Bolton. And now it's saying that our lookup array and our return array starts at A20. And now it's saying our lookup array starts at A20 to A69. So let's have a look at that. So let's go to emails. Okay, and now it's saying that our lookup array starts from A20 to A69, which means it's only going to look at these values. It's not going to look at the other values and Randall could have, and Randall may be sitting here. So what we actually want to do is that as we drag down, we actually do want to fix our tables, our arrays, our lookup value, which is C3, or the values in C can stay because that should move as we move one down but everything else needs to stay static. And we have touched on this when we want values not to move, when we want them to stay static, we just need to add dollar signs before the column and then after the row. So if you look at D2 and go to our formula bar, we see C2, which is fine. We're not going to do anything with our lookup value because that actually needs to remain dynamic. If we move one down, the lookup value needs to move one down, right? Because if we're looking for emails, this needs to be static. So just after column A2, just before A, add a dollar sign. And then just after A, add a dollar sign. Because remember, the dollar sign means that we're fixing column A, so it doesn't move no matter how much we drag. So we're fixing column A and row two. And then we're also gonna fix the same for A51. So we need to add a dollar sign before A and then a dollar sign after A. So this table will not move if we drag up and down. And then similar for our return array. So we need to add a dollar sign before B and after B. And then again before B51 and then just after B. And type enter. Great. On D2, let's go to the bottom right and let's just double click on that bottom right corner. And now let's have a look at Randall again. So. We have Randall, lookup value is C20. Our lookup array is A2 to A51. So let's just check if that's fine. So let's go to emails. And our lookup array was A2 all the way down to A51. That is correct. So now our tables are static. Then you can click on D20, click again, then double click the bottom right of the cell just to pass that formula all the way down. And now we have a full populated list of emails that only probably would take a few seconds to set up. It couldn't find just the first name Chloris, so it replaced that with not found, which is perfect. That's exactly what we wanted Excel to do. So you can take some time practicing this and doing it by yourself because it's quite an important formula to understand. But that's how you do XLOOKUP on Excel. Now that we know how VLOOKUP works, let's have a look at HLOOKUP. HLOOKUP in Excel stands for Horizontal Lookup. It is a function that makes Excel search for a certain value in a row in order to return a value from a different row in the same column. And remember, it's the opposite of VLOOKUP. So VLOOKUP makes Excel search for a certain value in a column in order to return a value from a different column in the same row. So VLOOKUP and HLOOKUP are similar, except one searches rows and the other one searches columns. So let's have a look at the HLOOKUP format. So on B12, I am just going to type equal sign and let's just type in HLOOKUP just to have a look at what we need to input. Again, the HLOOKUP format consists of four different input values. The first one is the lookup value, which is the value we want to look up or the value that we're going to use to search for our other value. 
We then need to input a table array. In this case, it's a range or the row where we find our lookup value as well as our return value. And our return value is the value that we want. The next input is row index number, which is the number of the row within our defined range that contains the return value. So basically in our array, is it row one, is it row two, is it row three, that has our return value, our value that we want. And then lastly, the range lookup. So zero, which means false for an exact match, and then one or true for an approximate match. So let's see how it works. Let's backspace B12. And here I have an HLOOKUP exercise for us. So we have this table where it tells us a different kind of nuts and the sales for each kind of nuts. And on the top here, I want to find out the sales for walnuts. We can use HLOOKUP here because we're telling Excel to search for the value in rows, not in columns. And let's find the sales. Let's type in equal sign, HLOOKUP, open brackets, our lookup value, which is walnuts, semicolon, our table array. So our table array would be B17 to F17 and then one down, which is B18 to F18. Our row index number, what row does our return value sit in? So if this is row one, this would be row two. So it's row two. And if we had maybe sales sitting here and maybe some different values on this row, then this would be row three. And our range lookup, we are saying false because we want an exact match. Close brackets and press enter. Okay, now it gives us walnuts at 4,399. Again, similar to B lookup if we want to change this. So instead of walnuts, let's change it to tree nuts and press enter. Okay, you can see it gives us the same. Now also note that B14 tree nuts needs to be exactly the same in terms of case as well as spaces as what's appearing in your table array. So if I do something like tree nuts, now just be aware that when you type in B14, it needs to be exactly the same as how it's showing up here. Okay, by exactly the same, there's a space in between tree nuts. Okay, if I remove the space on B14, it can't find it because that is quite different to that. It isn't case sensitive. So if we change all of these to small cases, Excel will still find your value. See, it still finds it. If we change tree nuts to peanuts, but all lowercase, it will still find it. But it just must be exactly the same. So there shouldn't be any spaces if there's no spaces. So it just must look exactly the same, but cases can be different. Another important feature in Excel is the ability to change cases. Excel provides us with three useful fonts to change the text to upper text, completely lower text or proper case. And we are going to have a look at how they work and apply it to our sales data. So in project3.xlsx, you can go over to the cases tab and we would like to convert this text into three different cases. So we are going to start with uppercase, then do it all in lowercase, and then finally proper case. Let's go to B5. Let's type in equals. And to convert a piece of text to uppercase, it is the function called upper, like that. Open brackets, and now we just need our text, which is on A3. Close brackets and press enter. And as you can see, this is now the uppercase version of this. We also then have the lower function, which converts all the text into lowercase. So let's try that out. On B6, we can type in equals and the function lower. Open brackets. 
Let's go ahead to A3, close brackets, and press enter. And now this transforms this text into lowercase. Then finally, we have the function proper. Now this converts your text to title case, where the first letter of every word is a capital. Let's have a look. Let's go to B7, type in equals, and let's use the function proper. Open brackets. Let's place in A3, close brackets, press enter. Obviously, this would come in handy in a lot of places if you get a spreadsheet sent to you and maybe the text there needs some cleaning up, you can apply these functions. So let's apply it to our actual data. So I want you to go over to the data tab and let's have a look at the column review. It should be column G. So let's do some text cleanup on column G because as you can see, the cases are maybe all over the place and it would be nice just to standardize it just to make it a bit more easier to read. So with that being said, let's do some text cleaning up in our data tab. So you can go to the data tab and let's have a look at the review column. Now this review column is all over the place. There's different text and there's spaces all over, which we'll learn to clean up a bit more later. But for now, I think what we should do is maybe standardize the text. And let's just make it into a proper format, just so it looks a bit more easier to read. So to do that, let us click on column H and let's insert a new column right next to column G. So right click on column H after you've clicked it and click on insert. Let's also call this review. And let's change all of this to proper case. So we are going to say equals, Let's bring our proper function, open brackets. Let's click on G2 and close brackets and type in enter. This looks so much more better than that. Let's just bring that throughout the column. So on the bottom right of H2, you can double click on it. And now we can see that we should have proper case for most of this. And in the next lecture, what we can do is we can fix these random spaces showing up as well with another neat function. Now is the ideal time to talk about the trim function. When you're dealing with extra spaces like this, we use the trim function. So in the last lecture, we cleaned up the review column by making the case standard. So we created another column and we used the function proper to make the text all title case. And now what we want to do is get rid of the extra spaces. To do that, we can use the trim function. And trim helps remove the extra spaces in the data, and it just cleans up the cell and makes it better. So what trim essentially does is remove any extra spaces at the beginning or the end of a text and in between as well. When I mean extra spaces is that if there's two words next to each other and a bunch of extra spaces, it will remove the extra space until there's one space left. At the beginning of a cell, it will remove all the extra space. So that's how trim works. So let's do that. And let's nest trim just before our proper formula. If we double click on H2, and let's encase this whole thing in a trim function. Before proper, you're gonna type in trim. You're going to open brackets. And then just after G2 close brackets, you're going to close another bracket. And what we're doing is we're telling Excel for cell G2, give me the proper case for it. And then trim any additional white spaces. And let's type enter on the bottom right of H2, go to the corner and double click it. Amazing. And now you can see that most of the white space is gone. So just remember what trim does is that trim removes any white space before the first character in your cell and any white space after the last character in your cell. And it removes the white space. So you can see on cell G7, there was quite a few white spaces between the word not and the word for. And Excel removed everything except one space. So you can see here between not and between for, there's just one space. With that being said, we can actually remove this column and use this as our main column. But we can't just delete it because I'm just going to show you what happens if we delete column G. 
So I'm clicking on column G and I'm deleting it. Okay, you can see everything goes away. We have our ref error, which means that we've deleted a cell that this references to. Let's click undo at the top. So what we can do is we can copy column H. So command or control C and let's paste it on G1. So click G1, go to paste, go to that little arrow and let's just do paste values. Okay. Now if we click on each row on G, we can notice it's not referencing a formula anymore. It's just word, which is perfect. So if we delete this, this is fine. Let's save this. Yeah, and that's how you use the trim function. Let's have a look at extracting parts of a text string, or basically a bunch of words. Now, this is quite an important technique for manipulating text in Excel. A lot of the times you see a text string, such as an ID number or social security number, which may have something like your date of birth within the first six characters, and you just want to extract that date of birth. How do you do that on Excel? So Excel has three functions, left, right, and mid, where you can get things like the date of birth from an ID number or phone numbers without an area code. Or if you have a job code that is quite structured where it has, you know, the first three characters is the person doing the job. Or if you have a job code that's quite structured where you get something like the first three characters of the code is a person doing the job and the next three is the client of the job, you'd be able to extract that information and isolate it quite nicely on Excel. So let's have a look at those functions in a bit more detail. Let's have a look at the left function. So the left function just extracts text starting on the left side. So it just works with the left. And how it works is that you tell Excel what text you want to be extracting, and then you tell Excel how many characters you want extracted from the left. So let's have a look. I have ID numbers here, and I want to know the date of birth. Now the date of birth in an ID number is the first six characters. So the first two characters is your year. So this represents 1995. 03 is the month, which is March. And 21 is your day, which is 21. So extracting the date of birth would mean that we need to take the first six characters from the left. So you would use the Excel left function. Let's click on B4, type equal sign, and let's call the left function. Open brackets. Excel is going to ask us, well, what text do we want to extract? And we want to extract A4, semicolon, and the number of characters we want from that text. And we just want six characters in each character. We want the year, the month, and the day. Close your brackets and enter. Okay, and as you can see, the first six characters here show up here. Double clicking on the bottom right of B4 to apply it across all our ID numbers. So again, very easy method to extract text as long as it's structured. So what I mean is that as long as your text has a specific structure, so we know that date of birth is the first six characters of an ID number. There's not some cases where it may be seven characters or eight characters. It's always going to be six characters. That's why you can use your left function. Quite similar, the right and the mid also works like that. It needs to work on very structured text strings where they maintain their format. So let's have a look at the right. So this here, our right function, extracts text from the right. So the opposite of what the left function does. So if we have a phone number with an area code, and we just want to extract the phone number. Phone number occurs on the right, and we would need to pull in all of these characters. Now, just to note, when we are counting characters from the right or from the left, we need to also count in any symbols or any spaces. So in this example, if we don't want the area code, which is the code in brackets, we are going to start from the right, and we are going to take in one, two, three, four, five, because I am including the space, six, seven, 
eight. So it'll be eight characters from the right. So let's do that. Let's go to B12, type equals, type in right, open your brackets, select A12, and our semicolon, and a number of characters would be eight. Close brackets, enter. Let's go to the corner and click and drag it to apply to all our phone numbers. And there we go, we have a phone number without an area code. And then finally, our last function is mid. So this extracts text in the middle. So here's an example. We have a job code, which consists of your employee ID, underscore department ID, underscore year. And if we want our department ID, we know that it occurs in the middle of the string. So we use the mid function. And the mid function works similar to your left and right functions. Except you need to tell Excel where do you want to start extracting because remember we are extracting in the middle of your text. So what character number we are going to start extracting. And here, if we want department ID, if we count from the left, so with mid you always count from the left, we're going to go one character, two characters, three characters, four. So we want to start extracting from the fifth character. And then we need to tell it how many characters must it extract. So we are going to extract two. So let's see it in action. On B20, let's type in equals. Type in mid. Open brackets. Click A20. Semicolon, our starting number would be five. Because remember, we're going five characters from the left. Okay, so one, two, three, four five and then the number of characters we want the number of characters we want extracted is two because we want the department id which is two characters and close brackets and there we go we can click the corner and just drag it down and here we have our department id extracted okay so in your project 3xlsx i am looking at the extract text tab okay so in your project three, under XLSX, I am looking at the extract text tab. And this is where we'll be performing our exercises. Going back to the lecture. Okay, so let's do it with our actual data. I'm looking at the age data tab, which should be around there somewhere. And here we have an email address and we have the person's age. Now, what I want is I just want a column that tells me the person's age in a number. That's it. I don't need person is X years old. I just want the age. What function would we use? Would we use left? Would we use right? Or would we use mid? We would use mid because we just want to extract the age, which occurs in the middle of the text. So let's do that. For column C, let's just type in age, number, can make it a bit bigger and let's use the mid function so c2 we're going to type in equals we're going to type in our mid function open brackets what text are we using we're using b2 semicolon our starting position so let's do some counting so we're going to count person one two three four five six the space which is seven I, 8, S, 9, space, which is 10. So we're starting in position number 11. And how many characters we need? How many characters do we need? We need two. Close brackets. Enter. Okay, perfect. That's looking very really good. Let's double click the bottom right of C2. Okay, amazing. And that's how you extract text on Excel. Let's talk about using find and replace in Excel. This is another useful feature of Excel where you can find certain cells or certain values and replace them with something else. So to access find and replace. So looking at project three Excel SX on our data tab, if you click on the home tab at the top, you can access find and replace here. So if you click on the magnifying glass on the right, and if you click on find, you'll now be able to find anything you want. So 
if I want to find the word COD, which is here by payment method, I can do that. And if I click find next, it will find the cell that equals the value of COD. And if I click find all, and it now outputs a table of where exactly I can find the word COD. So it will tell me the workbook, the sheet name, the cell, and the value. You also have some options. So if you click on options, you can also find it within a sheet or across your whole entire workbook, which consists of multiple sheets. You can also tell it to search by row or by column. And you can also tell it to look in formulas as well. You can also say that it needs to match the exact case. So if I put in COD in all small letters and click match case, it won't find anything because all my CODs in my workbook are capital. And if you just wanted to find an entire cell, you can click on find entire cells only, which means that if I had a phrase consisting of COD, Excel won't consider that as a match to the find. We'll just consider cells that only say COD. So for example, if I had a review that said that the COD process is bad and I select find entire cells only, and I'm just finding COD, the review won't show up because Excel will just look for cells that only consist of COD. So this is what we're going to do. Let's go to options and let's make sure that it's just finding stuff in the sheet. And I want Excel to find COD, but I want it to replace COD with cash on delivery. So let's click on the replace tab and we're going to say find COD and replace with cash on delivery. And you can either replace it one by one. So if you click on just replace, it will replace it one by one. Or if you want to replace all, you can by clicking replace all. It'll tell you how many replacements were made. And if you click OK, you can now see that COD is replaced with cash on delivery. Now, maybe you want to replace things only in a column or a row or a table that you've selected and not across your entire sheet or workbook. All you need to do is select your column. You can press control if you're on Windows or command if you're on Mac and F. And you'll see on the top here that the search bar appears and you can also do the exact same thing here. So what I want to do here is replace general with main. So if we're searching for general and press enter, it will show me where general appears. And now if I want to replace it and click on the search bar, and click on replace and you'll get to the same window. If you don't like that method, you can always just go to find and select and click on replace. Okay, so here we are going to find general and let's replace it with the word main. And we can say find all and it will tell us where exactly it's finding it from. And we can see it's all on column H, which is great. And then let's do a replace all. Okay, made 43 replacements. Okay, and close it. And that's how you use find and replace. In this lecture, we are going to be using conditions on Excel. A condition on Excel is where you give Excel options and based on the options that is true, Excel will return a specific output. A condition on Excel is where you give Excel options and based on whether the option is true, Excel will return a specific output. So let's look at our project three data. So I'm in my workbook project three dot xlsx and I'm on the tab data. And a good example of how we can use conditions on Excel is maybe if we create a column called rating type. And if the user gives the clothing a rating of higher than three out of five, the rating type column would be high rating. And if the rating is lower than three out of five, the rating type column would be low rating. So Excel has this function called if function can be combined with other logical functions. And we'll see that just now. And the if function can be combined with other logical functions like and, and, or to extend this logical test and to extend the whole function of the if function. But enough talking, let's try it out. So. Let's create a column called rating type. Let's create a column called working type. And I'm working with column N. 
And now let's use a function. So type in equals and let's type in if, open brackets. And now Excel will tell you what we need. So it's asking for a logical test. So when you think of logical test, think of using inequalities like your greater than sign, your less than sign, your equal to sign. Because essentially what we're going to do is our logical test here is if the rating is less than three out of five. Okay. Or in this case, since the rating is just out of five, we're going to say if the rating is less than three. Once we're done with the logical test, which is just rating is less than or greater than three can be even equal to depending on your scenario. We move on to what happens if this test is true. So in our example, what happens if the rating is greater than three? Well, Excel needs to output that this is a high rating. And what happens if the value is false? Then Excel must output that the rating is a low rating. And that's essentially the structure of an if function. You start off with the logical test. So what are you doing? What are you testing? What are you comparing? And you probably are going to be using inequalities there. What happens if your logical test ends up being true? What must Excel output? And then again, what happens if your test ends up being false? What must Excel output? What must Excel output? So our logical test here would be for cell K2. So if K2 is greater than three, that means that K2 can only be four or five. And I would say four or five would be a high rating. So that there is a logical test that K2 is greater than three. Type in semicolon. What happens if the value is true? Well, if the value is true, then let's just say that Excel must output high rating. And remember, we are typing text here. So whenever we do that on our formula bar, it needs to be enclosed in quotation. So if K2 is greater than three, it's a high rating. Semi semicolon. What happens if K2 is not greater than three? So if K2 is not greater than three, it means that the rating is either a one, a two, or a three, and that would be a low rating. So that's what we want Excel to output. So quotation marks for value if false, and let's just say low rating. Close quotation marks, and close your brackets. Let's press enter. Awesome. So here it's saying user gave it a rating of five out of five. That's a high rating. Let's see how it does for the other ones. So on N2, go to the bottom right of your cell and double click it. Okay, here we go. In cell K6, there's a rating of two and Excel has given that a low rating. Cell K10 has a value of three and Excel has given that a low rating. And that's how you use the if statement. Now let's take it one step further. So. This is a business and let's just say maybe they want to contact a customer if the customer has given them a rating of anything less than or equal to three out of five, or if the customer doesn't recommend the product. So if the customer doesn't recommend the product, so if this user recommend field is zero, or if this rating is less than or equal to three, the business wants to contact the customer just to check what's happening. How would we input two conditions? Okay, we do that using the OR statement. So let's go to column O and let's call this column contact customer. And let's type in column O2 equals sign. And let's type in OR because we're using the OR function. And the OR function basically can test two inequalities or two tests. So open brackets and you can see it gives us a logical test one and another logical test. So we can have 10 different conditions in an OR function. So the first condition is that we need to contact the customer if our rating is less than or equal to three. Or that's why we are using the OR function, or if a user doesn't recommend the product. Our logical one or logical test one would be if K2 is less than or equal to three. Semicolon, what's our other logical test? It will be if L2 is equal to zero because if L2 is equal to zero, it means that the user is not recommending the project because if L2 is equal to zero, it means the user is not recommending the product and let's close brackets. 
And you can see we don't need to contact the customer because the customer gave the product a high rating and the customer recommends the product. Okay, so let's click on O2. Let's go to the bottom right until you get the crossbar. So I've now applied it across the whole data set. Okay, if you just go to the bottom right and double click it, or you can click and drag. And now let's have a look. So we should contact this customer because it's saying that, yes, it's true. The customer gave a low rating and the customer doesn't actually recommend. Now, what happens if the customer does recommend that? What happens if we change L621? Okay, so we changed L621. It still remains true because remember, this is an or function. It's saying that this condition needs to happen or this condition needs to happen. As you can see, this function or outputs a value that's true or false. True if one of the conditions is met or false if none of the conditions are met. But let's put it in an if statement, okay? So to put it in an if statement, let's backspace everything. Type in equals, type in if, open brackets. And now what we're going to do is we're actually going to put our entire or function into that logical test. So we're going to say if, and then our or function, because we want more than one tests, our first logical test would be if the rating K2 is less than or equal to three. And our second logical test would be if the user rating L2 is equal to zero. So if either of these happen, we need to contact the customer. Okay, so there's two there. So as you can see, I'm just closing off my brackets. So that is my all function. This is my logical test. Okay, so this is essentially the logical test. So semicolon, I'll value if true. So what happens if the rating is less than five or the user doesn't recommend the product? We need to say contact customer. Those quotation marks, semicolon. Now what happens if the value is false? Okay, so if the user gives us a high rating or the user recommends a product, we can just say then do not contact. Okay, in quotation marks, those brackets, and enter. Now we can go to the bottom right of cell O2 and double click it. And now we have a nice column which tells us when we should or shouldn't contact the customer based on whether they give us a high rating or whether they recommend our products. Let's cover the AND statement. The AND statement is very similar to the IF statement, but remember in the IF statement, just one condition needs to be true or one condition needs to happen. In the AND statement, both conditions must happen in order for the value to be true. Let's work on an AND statement. I want to say that if the user gives us a rating of five and the user recommends the product, let's send the user a thank you email. So let's do that. Let's create a column. So let's use column P and let's make it a bit bigger. And let's say, send customer thank you email. And let's use the and statement first. So we are going to say equals and, so on D2, open brackets. So if K2 is equal to five, that's our first logical statement. And our next logical statement is if L2 is equal to one, close brackets. Okay. So now what we're saying here is if K2 is equal to five or L2 is equal to one, then this and statement should output true. And true means we should send the customer a thank you email. Okay, and as you can see, it's true. Let's go to the right of P2 and double click it to apply it across. Okay, and you can see the value false here would be if the rating is not five or if the user doesn't recommend the product, it would be false. Okay, so for an and statement, both these conditions need to be met in order for it to be true. So how would we incorporate this into an if statement? Let's do that. So just double click on P2. Okay, and we know the and statement. So why don't we just add an if function right at the beginning, just before the and, and open brackets. Okay, this is our logical test. So we're telling Excel that we wanna test these two. It's an and statement, so both of them need to be correct. 
Okay, with the OR statement, only one needs to be correct. With the AND statement, both of these conditions need to be met. So if the user gives us a 5 out of 5 rating, and if the user recommends our product, then semicolon, value if true, we can say in quotation marks, send email or send thank you email, close quotation marks, semicolon, what happens if these conditions aren't met? Then we can say do not email because if they're not met, that means that the user hasn't given us a rating of five and they haven't recommended the product. So we're just going to say do not contact. Close quotation marks and then close brackets. Press enter and there we go. Okay, let's double click the bottom right of P2 to bring that formula across. And there we go. So now in these ones, we know that the user gave us a rating of five and recommended us. And then in these ones where it says do not contact, the user didn't give us a recommendation of five or they didn't recommend us. Okay. So remember for this to be true, both conditions need to be met. Otherwise it would be false. And now to end off, we can also do nested if statements. And this basically means that we can have more than one situation or more than one response. So for example, I have quite a lot of scenarios and I want to create a column called action. Okay. Where if a user gives us a rating of five and recommends us, then we must send the user a thank you email. But if the user gives us a rating of less than three and does not recommend us, then we must contact the customer ASAP. And if a user gives us a rating exactly equals to three, but does not recommend us, we need to send the customer survey just to see what's happening. So those are three separate actions, but we can also input everything in just one if statement. So let's do that. So on column Q, let's call column Q action. And let's begin our nested if statement. So for Q2, Type in equals, let's type in if, open brackets, and our first test will be if the user gives us a rating of five and if the user recommends us, let's send that user a thank you email. So we're going to introduce more than one condition. So we're using and, open brackets, and let's just say if k2 is equal to five, Semicolon, you can see Excel is telling us, okay, we need the next logical test, which is L2 is equal to one. Okay, that's it for now. Send customer thank you email. Close quotation marks. Semicolon, I can actually introduce a new condition. Okay, because I'm saying if that's not true, let's move on to the next one. So we can say here, with another if statement. And let's just say if the user gives us a rating of less than three, so either two and one, or the user doesn't recommend us, we need to contact that customer immediately. So we're doing an if statement and the if statement will be placed exactly where it says value if false, we're introducing a new if statement or, so if the user gives us a rating, so K2 again, if it's less than three, or we can just say less than or equal to two. So if the user's given us a rating, which is K2, which is less than or equal to two, or L2 is equal to zero. So the user doesn't recommend us. Close brackets. So that's our logical test done. Our value if true, in quotation marks, contact customer ASAP, close quotation marks. And now let's do one more condition. Let's bring in another one. And what we're going to say is if our rating is equal to three and the user doesn't recommend us, we must send the survey. If our rating is equal to three and our user doesn't recommend us, so we're using an and function, open brackets and open brackets again, our logical test. Remember we still sticking to the same role. Our logical test here would be our rating, which is K2, is equal to three. And in our other logical test, if the user 
doesn't recommend. So if our user recommend is equal to zero, close brackets, that's all the conditions for this one. Value if true, we need to send customer survey, close quotation marks, and then to end that off, our value if false. So if none of these conditions for across our whole formula is not being met, we're going to say quotation marks, do nothing. Okay. Because we don't need to do anything else. Those are brackets. A quick recap. We are having multiple conditions in our if statement with multiple outputs. The first one is that if our rating is equal to five and the user recommends us, then we are going to send the customer a thank you email. However, if in a totally different condition, our rating is less than or equal to two and the user doesn't recommend us, we need to contact the customer ASAP. And the last one is that if our rating equals to three and the user doesn't recommend us, we need to send the customer a survey. And if none of those conditions are met, then we don't need to do anything. That's a formula. And let's close some brackets because we do need for every if function, we do need a closing bracket. So since there's three if functions here, we should have three closing brackets and type enter. Perfect. Let's just make this a bit bigger. Okay. And then go to the bottom right of Q2 and then apply it. Double click it to apply it everywhere. Now we have a nice action column with a quite a big nested formula where we've asked Excel to output something specific based on the conditions that we've inputted. So to practice, I want you to try it out with another column, just because this takes some time to get used to. So let's scroll to the right for payment method. And let's create a new column. So you can select column G, right click and say insert. And let's call this column payment details. And what I want here is the payment details for this payment method. So. The payment details are as follows. If the payment method is free, the payment detail should be coupon. If the payment method is credit card online or debit card online, the payment detail should be online payment. And lastly, if the payment method is cash on delivery, the payment detail should be cash. So I want you to pause this video and try and work on your nested if statement. And when you come back, I'll show you the answer. Okay, so we're back and you should have populated the payment details. Let's have a look at the answer. We're going to start off with an if function and we're saying if f2 equals free, it's a coupon. That is the value if true. However, false is another if function. This time we're doing an or function because if F2, which is a payment method, is equal to credit card online or debit card online. It's an online payment, which you can see here. So I said if in an or function, if F2 is credit card online or F2 is debit card online, if true is an online payment for this. Our value if false would be another if statement. And again, we're going to say if F2 is cash on delivery, it's known as cash. And then our final value, if false, if anything else isn't met, you could have wrote whatever you want, but I just said unknown. That's it. Okay, so that is a introduction to if statements on Excel with some logical conditions. Let's talk about conditional formatting. So conditional formatting in Excel enables you to highlight cells with a certain color depending on the cell's value. Now, conditional formatting does work at a cell level, so we never get it to highlight rows. Everything is generally at a cell level. So here's an example. Let's just say that I want to highlight cells that maybe have a rating that is less than or equal to three. How would I do that? I'm on project three, Excel SX, and I'm on my data tab. And I want to highlight cells that have a rating of less than three. How would I do that? So let's select 
column L. Let's make sure that we're on our home tab and select conditional formatting. Let's go to highlight cell rules and let's select less than. And now Excel will give us some formatting options. We can choose a style if you want a two color scale or three color scale, etc. Some rules here. So the format only cells that contain, which is correct. So what it's saying is, should it only color the cells that contain our specific value? And that's true. Now it's asking, well, what value? So we're going to say cell value. And instead of less than, let's do less than or equal to. And then here we type in three. You can also choose how you want the color to be displayed. So the default is always light red full with dark red text, but you can choose different formatting as well as custom ones if you want to do personal formatting. Okay, but basically this should highlight any cells in our rating column that is less than or equal to three. So click okay. All right, and here we go. So now we can see the cells that are less than or equal to three. Similar with this, you can also do between a certain number. Let's just clear the conditional formatting. So go to conditional formatting, go to clear rules and select clear rules from entire sheet. So click on column L, conditional formatting, highlight cell rules, and you have all these options, but let's do between. Now we can highlight the cells between a certain value. So again, we staying with all of this selection and let's just highlight cell values between one and two. And let's just fill it instead of light red full with dark red text. Let's do green full with dark green text and click OK. Now this highlights cells with just values for one and two. Let's clear this formatting again. So go to conditional formatting, clear rules and clear rules from entire sheet. If you do want to highlight the entire row, you can as well. So first things first, let's select our table. So just Press this corner button here. And let's just say that we want to highlight the entire row that has a rating of less than three out of five. So go to conditional formatting, highlight cell rules, less than. Okay. We're going to keep the style. When it says format only cells that contain, let's do a use formula to determine which cells to format. And here, what we do is we say equal sign. We're going to put the dollar sign and the column where the rating occurs, which is L1. Okay, so that is the rating column, L1. And then we're going to say it's less than or equal to three. Okay, so quite a fixed format for you to remember, but it's always equal sign, the dollar sign to fix your column, and L1, that's where the column occurs, and it's less than or equal to three. And now we have the whole row, which is highlighted with the ratings that are less than or equal to three. You can also add to the conditional formatting. So maybe we also want to highlight payment details that are in cash. So let's do that. So again, let's select our table, go to conditional formatting, go to highlight cell rules. Let's say text that contains. Okay, because now we're just going to say something is equal to. We can keep the style as classic. So a format only cells, let's do a use formula again, and let's do it on payment details. So we are going to say equals dollar sign, and it's column G1 is equal to, and let's just say in quotations, cause it's text cash like that. And let's do a green fill. And this should highlight cells that have payment details as cash. So select OK. And there we go. The other one to note that's quite popular is that if you're working with unique values, so like maybe if you have something like a customer ID, which can be unique, and you want to make sure that there's no duplicates, if you go to conditional formatting, highlight cell rules, there is a duplicate values here where that picks up any duplicate values, which is good for columns that should be unique. Okay, we're just going to clear the formatting. So click on conditional formatting, clear rules, and clear rules from entire sheet. Cool. And that's conditional formatting.
The other thing that's cool about conditional formatting is you can actually highlight top 10 and bottom 10, which is great if you work with rankings. So an example here is that I want to find the top 10 reviews with the most likes. Okay, so if I click on column in, and if I click on conditional formatting, and if I click on top or bottom rules, you can see we have many options here. We can choose to highlight the top 10 items, the top 10 by percent, opposite, bottom 10 items, bottom 10 by percent, or items above average or items below average. So let's check our top 10. We're gonna leave the formatting and let's just see. And we do want a top 10. And let's just click OK. Now you can see that it highlights the top 10 reviews with the most likes. Let's clear this. Special formatting, clear rules, clear rules from entire sheet. You can also do a top 10 by percent. So again, let's select review likes, conditional formatting, top or bottom rules, and let's do a top 10%. Now this gives you the top 10%. So click OK. And this would give you a top 10% of reviews. Let's clear it one more time. So select column in, conditional formattings, clear rules, clear rules from entire sheet. And let's do one more. So select review likes, and you can select whatever column you want. Conditional formatting, top or bottom rules, and let's do likes that are below average. Yeah. So here, I just want to highlight likes that are below the average and click OK. Okay, and all these highlighted are any reviews that have likes below the average. And that's conditional formatting in Excel. Another part of conditional formatting, which is quite fun, is using data bars, color schemes, and icon sets. And they sort of make your table a bit more visual, which is really awesome. So I'm sure you've seen tables that are almost color-coded, where they'll take a column, and if the profit is high, it will be very green, and if the profit was low, it goes down to a red color, which looks very cool. So we're going to have a look at that. And in your Project 3 workbook, we do have a tab called Sales Data. So you can click on that, and let's have a look at how data bars look. So what I'm going to do is I am going to work with profit margin, and let's just have a look at how data bars look. So let's select profit margin. Let's go to conditional formatting and let's try data bars. So if you select data bars and you can select whether you want a gradient full, so whether it goes from lighter to darker or darker to lighter or just a plain solid full, and you can select your color, it really doesn't matter. So let's select a blue. And now you can see how much it transforms your graph and you can make it bigger because now we can easily see where the negative profit margin is. And we can see how big or how small it is and similar to your positive margins. So it's quite a nice way of doing things and it's obviously very quick and you can do it with any column. So if you want to do the same for profit, let's click on profit, go to conditional formatting, data bars, and let's do profit as green. Okay. And now we have the same for profit. You could also have more rules. So if we click on profit margin, go to conditional formatting, data bars, and down below, select more rules. And here it just gives you a bit more customization of your data bar. So whether you have your minimum or your maximum, which is usually just automatic direction, which can be contextual, but if you just want it left to right or right to left, you can. And then you can also change your positive or your negative values. You can have borders, axes, etc. So it just gives you a bit more customization. Let's remove this. So we can select the cells, go to conditional formatting, clear rules, and we can do clear rules from entire sheet or clear rules from selected cells, whatever you prefer. And let's see how it looks for color scheme. So again, let's select profit margin. Let's go to conditional formatting. And so data bars, let's check color scales. And here you can choose any color scale you want, but I'm choosing the first one. So the first one is usually green represents high, yellow is medium, red is low. Straight away, we can immediately see the low profits and the high profits, which is really cool.
Again, we can customize that. So if we click on J, conditional formatting, color scales, and let's click more rules. Here you can choose a minimum value, which can be the lowest value, or if you want to have it at a number or percent, you can. So for instance, the minimum value can just be zero and the maximum value can be a hundred or one because it's a percent. And you can say the maximum, if it reaches one, we can have it green and the minimum, if it reaches zero or more, we can have it red. Okay. And let's just see, as you can see, this is a lot more deeper than the other one. So I do recommend you playing around with the color scheme just to make it look a bit better. Let's clear this. So select J, conditional formatting, clear rules, and select either one here. And then let's do one of my favorite ones, which is the color icons. So again, let's do profit margin, conditional formatting, icon sets. And here you can choose your icon. So over here, there's arrows. So if something is going up or increasing, it's green. If it's in the middle, it's yellow. If it's going down, it's red. In different versions, you also have shapes and indicators. So let's do shapes. And now let's fix the rules because 80% profit margin is pretty good, but it's yellow. So let's click on J. Let's go to conditional formatting. Let's go to icon sets. And let's click on more rules. Okay. And here you can actually customize your rules. So you can choose your icons that you want, whatever you want. You can choose to reverse it or to just show the icon and not the number. And here you can actually customize the values and the colors as well. I would say anything above 50% would be green. Okay. If it's type percent, which is great. And then yellow would be between 20 to 50. And then red would be less than 20. Don't worry about these. These will pre-populate when you click OK. And if we click OK, then this would change. So you can see this now matches our rule. And if you do want to actually manage the rules, so if you go to conditional formatting, manage rules, you can click on the rule and say edit rule. And again, you can edit your rule here. So this is nice if you have multiple rules. And we have indicated, and obviously you can apply conditional formatting to any of your cells, any of your numerical cells. You can't do it on text, obviously. But also the way you don't want to make your spreadsheet too cluttered. So usually one or two columns works quite well. Let's talk about building charts on Excel. And for that, you can open the workbook project 4xlsx And we are on the tab structure of a chart. So what is a chart? A chart is a visual representation of numeric values. And it's great to use because charts make your data a lot more easier to read. And you can read large volumes of data, analyze trends, and make sense of your data. And before you create a chart on Excel, you do need to have data because Excel uses the data to create a chart. The data is usually stored in a nice table on your Excel spreadsheets. And when you're able to create a chart, this is something that you can output on Excel. And when you create a chart in Excel, this is usually what you see. So before we move on to creating charts, let's just have a look at the structure of a chart. So the first thing you get is the chart title. This area over here, so this white area is known as your chart area. The area here, this gray area, is known as your plot area. These are called data series, which is basically the data that you use to plot your chart. This is known as a vertical axis. This is known as a horizontal axis, and this is a legend. So with that being said, let's go ahead and create a chart. So you can go to the sales tab and I'm just going to zoom in. And to create a chart, all you have to do is select the data that you want. So in this chart, we have a date. We have some actual sales and some predicted or budgeted sales. So let's create a chart. Let's select the table. Let's go to insert and immediately we can see that we can create some charts. So let's click on this first icon. So Excel gives us some recommended charts. 
which is quite nice to see. Or if you want to start from scratch, you can select any of these icons. So let's select the bar chart icon. And let's select this first one, which is just a 2D column. Okay. You can make it how big or how small you want it. So let's talk about formatting. The first thing you can do on Excel is sometimes you create a chart and you realize that you may want to maybe switch the rows and columns which isn't the case here, but it is still possible. If you go to your chart design tab, which only shows up if you select the chart. So if you don't select it, if you select any cell, it doesn't show up. Once you select the chart, your chart design tab shows up. And over here, you can change the formatting of your chart and change your chart type. But for now, let's click on the switch row and column. And now what Excel does is that it switches our rows and our columns. And as you can see here, actual sales and predicted sales becomes our rows. And as you can see here, actual sales and predicted sales becomes our X axis. Our months have now become colors, which isn't ideal. So let's go back. We can go back by pressing the undo button or typing control Z or command Z if you're on Mac. So once you've created a chart, maybe you don't like this sort of type. If you go back to your chart design tab, go to chart type, you can now change it to a chart type that you want. So if we want to change it to a line chart, we can. Let's go back to a bar chart. So you can control or command Z or press the undo button on the top. I also want to point out that you can apply different chart layouts and there are ways to do that. The first way is through the quick layout here. And here you can decide how you want it. So if we click on the first one, okay, Excel puts in a legend to the right. And if we click on the second one, Excel changes the format a bit, removes the grid lines, formats this a bit differently, puts the legend on top. Let's try maybe this one here. So second row in the middle, layout five. So here it adds a chart, but also adds a table, which I think is quite useful if you are not going to report on the table and you just want to show the actual data. That's a common layout and you can choose many more. You also have the ability to change your formatting on this here as well. These are all predefined formats. So as you can see, as you click through, you can change your different formatting. So this is nice for quick formatting because you don't really have to think about it too much. So I'm going to keep my chart style on maybe the first one here. The other thing you can do is add or delete chart elements. So in some cases you choose a quick layout and it gives you everything you want, but sometimes you may want more. Sometimes you may want the chart title to be somewhere else or this to actually go away. And what you can do is you can actually do it yourself. So if you go to add chart element, you can actually choose or remove things that you don't want. So if we go to axes, we can see that there is a primary horizontal axis and a primary vertical axis. What if we click out of primary horizontal? So let's do that. Okay, we can see that our dates have now disappeared. To add that back in, go to add chart element, axis and click primary horizontal. What if I wanna get rid of this table here? You go to add chart element. It's called a data table. And you can just say none. You can also add axes titles if you want. So there is an axes title for the vertical one, our y axis. We should have one for our x axis as well. We'll fill it in all at the end. We have a chart title, it's above, which is perfectly fine. Our data labels for me currently they're on the center, which I think is obviously not that neat. So I'm going to move it to the outside end, which looks a bit better. We've touched on data table. If we are using error bars, this is where you do it. If you want to add grid lines, you can. So if you want to add maybe major vertical grid lines, you can. And you can also add minor and horizontal. The legend. So if you do want a legend, which I think we do need one, you can add one. So let's have a legend on top and then a trend line. So if we click on a trend line, you can select what your trend line wants to be based on. So I'm going to say actual sales, click OK, and your trend line appears. Okay. If we click on the chart and go to format, 
You also have the ability to change the style as well. So you can, for instance, change the shape full. So if we change it to, let's just change it to blue, just to show you. Okay, let's go back to white here. If you want an outline for the entire chart, you can. So let's just do a gray outline and you can change the weight here as well. So that makes an outline of the chart. Just going back to format. You can just do all your usual text formatting, which you can play around. You can't really go wrong with formatting, but this just formats your whole chart. Now, if you want to change the color of your data bars, maybe edit the labels, you can. So if we click on a series, right click and select format data series. Here you can decide things like the width of your gap. So whether you want your bars to be smaller or bigger and whether they overlap or not. So I don't like them to overlap too much. That's with the bar icon. You can also decide if you want your series on a secondary axis, so on a totally separate axis, or on a primary one. Okay, and remember we're just working with the blue bar for now. Here is where you want to add shadows to it, glows, etc. So it's a bit more custom formatting, which I don't really play around with, but you are welcome to. And then here is where you can change the color. So you can change the full if you want no full, or if you want a solid full or a gradient full, or you want to apply a picture inside or some sort of pattern full or automatic, which is usually just the default. Let's select solid full and let's change the color to a green. So any green that you want. Okay. We're not going to have a border and you can play around with this as well. Like I said, you can't really go wrong with formatting. You choose what you want to see and what looks nice for you. Okay, and then if you click on the other orange series, you do the same here. So exactly the same formatting. So if we want to change the color, so let's make this gray. To change the formatting of your data labels, click on the label. And here you can actually tell Excel what the label should contain. Should it just contain the value? Should it contain the series name? Should it contain the value from the cells, the category name, etc.? Usually value is just fine. You can also do some more alignment with this. Again, you can play around with the shadow and glow here. And here you can change the way it looks. If you want your labels filled in, the color, etc. Now, if you go to text options, here you can change the color of your text. Again, you can play around with shadow, reflection and glow. And here in text box is, is where you can decide how you want your text direction. So alignment should be fine. It's always in the middle. You can have a top or bottom, but you won't really see much for your labels. Text direction is where you can have that rotated text, which looks a lot better and cleaner, which is what we want. Clicking on this series, let's do the same. So if I click on that and you can either right click and say format data labels, text options. But usually if you're working on this pane and you click between the two data series, it should stay as you can see. Click on the text box and direction should be that way. To fill in your chart title, you just click on chart title, double click and call it whatever you want. So I'm just going to say sales by month. Access title is the same as well. So just click on the access title, double click, backspace, and let's call that sales. And then here, double click, backspace everything, and we can call this date. Okay, so chart formatting is very personal. There's a lot of things that you can do that we've spoken about. I generally like to leave my charts quite flat, but some people like to add, for instance, borders on this. So if you click on that shape and maybe add something like a shadow, you can see that there's now a shadow on there. You can add a border if you click on the shape here and you now we can add a thick border on there. So it really depends on you and what you want. So I'm just going to undo that. But usually I think it's important to pick a format that is not too complex to do, but also that looks very easy to read. Because remember, the purpose of a chart is to get the user to ingest as much information as they can in a short period of time. Now, the other thing I want to note before we move on is that when we create a chart, it usually gets inserted in the same sheet. 
Some people like to have your chart on a separate sheet just to make it easier to look at and even easier to present. So if you do want that, you can click on your chart, right click it, say move chart, okay? And then you can choose where you want the chart to be placed, either in a new sheet called chart one or either as an object in another worksheet. So I'm going to say new sheet and let's just call it sales by month and click okay. And now we have a sheet that just has a chart. That's just an introduction in charts. In the next few sections, we're going to go over the main charts where we can play around a bit more on the formatting as well. And towards the end, I'll show you how to build a simple dashboard, which is quite useful as well. So in the next few sections, we are going to do a deep dive of different chart types. Now, before we do that, I just want to touch on the importance of charts. We know that you create charts usually to make a point or to communicate a specific message. And choosing the correct chart type is often a key factor in the effectiveness of the message. So it's really important for you to go over the different chart types in Excel, play around and see what works for your specific data. So in this section, what we're going to do is I'm going to go over the main chart types in Excel We'll play around a bit with formatting and the benefits of using each chart. So let's start with your basic column chart. And I want you to open up project4.xlsx. It's the same workbook we've been working in. And go down to the sales tab. And let's start off with column charts. Now column charts are probably your most common charts. So we have some data here. It has a date. It has actual sales and it has predicted sales. And let's create a chart. So to create a chart, select your table, go to insert, and in the insert section, in this section here, click on this chart icon, and let's do a 2D column chart. Okay, so this is your common chart also do one series so maybe we don't want the second bar so just click on the orange bar and backspace it and just have the actual sales but if you do want to continue with the showing both series you can just press that undo button it should give you both series so as i said this is probably the most common chart type and it displays each data point as a vertical column and the height of which corresponds to your value. Okay, so for April 2022, we have a value of just under 60,000. So it's actually 58,130 sales for actual sales. And then predicted is around 45,000. Generally for these kind of charts, we know that your axis usually sits on the left and usually your Y axis is numerical and then you have your X axis, which generally has dates or categories, and that sits at the bottom. And if you do want to bring in another series, so maybe you just want to see sales by a certain category, then that would mean just adding another column here. And then making sure you select the whole table, and then if you do the same insert chart, then that additional series would add on here. Now, Theoretically, if you're working with dates, dates are continuous, and this should actually be a line chart, but it actually depends on your stakeholder. So take note of that. Some people like seeing bar charts with dates specifically because I think it is a bit easier on the eyes to read a bar chart versus a line. If you're going to be sending reports on your cell phone, if your stakeholders are going to be reading reports that have charts on their cell phones, you want to be able to actually see it properly and therefore quite a lot of people prefer bar charts to line charts. So it really depends on the stakeholder. So let's do some formatting while we're here. So click on your chart and let's go to chart design and let's choose one of these pre-populated formats. Okay, so I like this third one here, but you can select whatever you want. And the thing I want to change here would be adding a chart title. Let's add some axes labels. Let's rotate these also so that they are reading vertically. And let's add 
And I think that's it. So let's do it. So when you click on your chart, go to add chart element, go to chart title and click above chart. And let's call this actual sales versus predicted for 2022. So now we've added the title. Let's add the axes labels. So click on your chart, make sure you still on the chart design tab, go to add chart layout, and let's do axes titles and select primary horizontal, double click on axis title, and let's just call it date. Okay. Add chart element again, and let's do the Y axis to so axis title, and let's do primary vertical. Let's double click that and let's call that sales. Okay. And I wanted to rotate these values as well because they are combining in some bars. So it doesn't look great. So let's select the actual values. So make sure you select the labels, right click and say format data labels. Let's select text options. That's where you can rotate your label. And select the last icon, which has a text box. Okay. And here we go. We can change the text direction instead of horizontal. Let's do rotate or text 270 degrees. Alignment. Why don't we have it on the outside? Now let's actually move these labels to the outside. So click on label options. And you can see label position here. Instead of inside end, let's have outside end. And now let's do the same for the orange series. So let's click on the actual labels, right click and say format data. So let's click on the orange labels. Okay. This pane should still be showing up. If it doesn't, then all you need to do is right click and say format data labels and click format data labels. Go to text options. Click the last icon here. We're going to say text direction is now rotate all text to 70 degrees. And then let's move this also on the outside end. So label options and where it says label position, select outside end. Perfect. While we're here, let's change the series color. So let's click on the blue bar and to change the series color, we go to the full bucket. Let's click on full and where it says color here, you can change it to whatever color you want. So let's do green. If you do want a pattern full. If you click on pattern fill, you can actually choose your pattern fill you want. So let's do maybe something simple. So I'm doing this one here, which is horizontal lines and having it as green and orange one, why don't we just make it a solid fill and let's change it to blue or let's change it to a yellow. And while we're here, let's cover the stacked column in percent. So I want you to go to the tab sales stacked column, and I'm just going to zoom in. Now this has similar data. So it has the date, it has clothing sales, and it has furniture sales per month. So obviously the store has clothing and it sells furniture and they are just calculating the monthly sales. So let's create a stacked column, but a percent, and you'll see how it looks now. Select your table, click insert, go to the icon, the bar chart icon. And now let's click on stacked column here. And here you can see that now we have one bar, but each bar has a different color and each bar color represents our series. So the blue color represents clothing sales. And then the orange represents furniture sales. So this is another way to display data. And what's nice about this is that in one bar, you can actually tell a lot. So you can tell the value of your furniture sales. So you can tell the value of your clothing sales and you can tell the value of your furniture sales, and you can also tell the total value. So this may be another nice graph to do. And another one that's similar is your stacked column in percent. So if we click on our chart and go to change chart type, click on column and in 2D column, click the last one, which is a hundred percent stacked column. 
Okay, so this graph looks a bit different, and this actually shows the relative contribution of each product by month. So it doesn't have the actual value. You can see here, we now have percentages, but we do have the month. And what it tells us is the percentage of total sales that each category has. So furniture for January has taken about 90% of the January sales, and then the remainder is clothing. And if you hover over the bars, you can actually see the value. But if you don't hover, you don't see the value. You just see the percentage breakdown of each category. So this chart is actually a really great alternative to having a bunch of pie charts if you want to break down percentages you know, by category. And I feel like it's not as popular as pie charts, but definitely a better output. Again, we can do the same formatting that we've done, but to make things a bit quicker, why don't we just choose a nice predetermined format? So go to chart design and select any one you want. So I'm going for the second one just to change things up. And again, I prefer my labels rotated, so I'm just gonna fix that quickly. So I'm clicking on the furniture sales data labels. And you can right click and say format data label should take you to this. Let's click on text options, click the last icon here, and let's change text direction to rotate all text to 270. Let's change the color to black as well. So go to text fill and outline. And where it says color, instead of white, let's change it to black. If we go to label options and click on this icon, Let's change the label position to inside base. That always looks a bit better. And now let's do something very similar to the blue data labels. Click on the blue data labels, right click, say format data labels, click format data labels, click on the label options, the chart icon. Let's do inside base. While we're here, let's click on the full bucket and let's change this to black. Go to text options and click on this icon here, which is the first one. And let's change the color to black. Go to text options, click on this last icon here. And let's change the text direction to rotate all to 270. Let's just double click on chart title, backspace everything. And let's just say clothing and furniture sales for 2022 by month. And just a note, if you do want these in currencies, you can also do that. Yeah. So two notes here is that if you do want to move a label, you can. So we can see that these two labels are overlapping. So let's click on the orange label and let's just drag it a bit up. The other note is maybe you do want to display currency formatting. So what you can do is click column B and column C. Make sure you're on the home tab. Go to general and you can either click currency or accounting. So I'm just going to click currency, which is perfect. And then while we at it, let's round down. So let's click on this icon here. Okay. And then again, if there's any overlapping labels, you can just move it. And then just to note while we're here, you can also, if you click on your chart, Go to chart design, go to change chart type, and still stay on column. You can also do 3D columns, which I don't really recommend. I think 3D columns do look a bit dated sometimes. So I would say stick to 2D columns. And then they're exactly the same thing, but you can also do 2D bars where the axes are rotated. So if we click on 2D bar, okay, we can see. Just mind the formatting that now our dates appear on the y-axis and the numbers appear on the x-axis, which is another popular way of displaying data. It works great if you have categories. So maybe if you're showing just sales by your categories, it's a lot more easier to read categories this way from left to right than, you know, horizontal labels than vertical labels on your x-axis. Okay, we can just click undo. And that's how you do columns or bar charts on Excel.
So I touched on the uses of a bar chart on Excel, and I thought it might be nice to show you an example. So a bar chart, like I said before, is essentially a column chart that's been rotated 90 degrees clockwise, where your axes have been swapped. And one distinct advantage to using a bar chart is that if your category labels are quite long, it's much more easier to read if it's horizontal than vertical. So I'll give you an example. We're on the workbook project 4xlsx and you can have a look at your bar chart tab. So in this example, we have our data, which has product names, which are quite long, and just the total sales. So quite a simple data set. And let's create a bar chart. So we're going to select our table, go to insert, click on that same bar chart icon and scroll down till you get to 2D bar and click on the first chart. All right, and here we have a chart. Now, as you can see, it's a lot more easier to read your categories this way than the other way. And to show you, let's change our chart type. So let's click on the chart, go to change chart type, go to column and select 2D column. All right, and here's our 2D column chart. So as you can see, same data, but it does seem a bit more easier to read the category labels when they're the other way. So this is all about the user experience and what way to make the data a lot more easier to read. And how do you display the data so it's a bit more easier to read? And I would say for this specific example, you would use a bar chart. Okay, and you can format it however you like. So I am not going to do much formatting in this one. I'm just going to go to chart design on the top here and click on the second formatting. That's perfect for me. Cool. Let's save. And this is how you do a bar chart in Excel. Let's do some line charts. A line chart can use any number of a data series. And you distinguish the lines by using different colors, line styles, etc. So I'm sure we must have all seen a line chart before. Pretty simple to do. And often, like I said, when you are doing something like date versus sales, date versus cost, line charts are best practice. But also I mentioned that some people just prefer bar charts. So it really depends on the user. So let's do some line charts. And I just want to plot date and furniture sales. I do not want to plot clothing sales as yet. So to do that, let's select column A and hold control if you're on Windows, command if you're on Mac and select column C. Go to insert and in our chart section, click on this line icon. And here you have quite a lot of options. So you have a line, stacked line, 100% stacked line, line with markers, stacked line with markers and then a hundred percent stacked line with markers. So we'll look at all of them, but for now, let's just do the 2D line and the first chart. Simple enough. Always apply the same formatting. So if you want to add some axes title, just make sure you're on the chart design tab, go to add chart element, put in the axis title. If you want to add grid lines, you can, if you want to add a legend, you can over here. But here you can also edit your line itself. So if you click on the line, right click and say format and click on format data series. Over here, if we click on the full bucket, you can change the color of your line. You can change whether you don't want a line and you just want to see markers, a solid line. If you want a gradient line, which starts off dark and then disappears or just automatic, which is defaulted. So if we go to solid line, here we can change the color of a line. So let's make it orange and we can change the transparency, which just makes it lighter or darker. You can change the width of your line if you want it a bit thicker or a bit thinner. You can also change your line style. So if you want the line to be straight, curvy, hand-drawn or wavy, I like straight. You can change how the line looks. So if you want a double line, etc. So just back to normal. You can decide if you want your line dashed or not. A lot more other options. You can also add markers in your full bucket. If you go to marker, you can decide if you do want a marker or not. Okay, so if you go to marker options and click on automatic, 
Now you should see some markers showing up, or if you click on built-in, you have the option to customize your marker. So if you want something like a square, or if you want something like circles or triangles or crosses. So I want to do just normal circles and I want to make them a bit big so we can see them. And here you get the option of changing your marker color as well. So if we want to change the color to black, we can, whatever color you want. So I'm just going to keep it as orange and some other formatting that you can do with your marker. Now, if you do want to add another series, you can do it with your select data column. So if we click on a chart, go to select data, you can leave the chart data range, but here is where we can add more series. So if we click on this plus icon here, we can leave this chart data range because it stays the same, but we can choose our name. So you can either type in your name or click on this white cell and click on B1 and click on this white cell to the right again. And Y values, exactly the same. Click on column B, click on the white cell again. X axis labels, we don't need them for now, it's fine. Horizontal axis labels, we don't really need it for now, so it's fine, and click OK. Right, and now we can see we have two series. This one represents clothing sales, because if I click on it, this gets highlighted. And then this one represents furniture sales. Perfect. So what we can do is let's format this. So click on clothing sales and let's change the color here to maybe blue. Okay, let's change the marker to also blue. So let's move from line to marker. So if you click on clothing sales, so if you click on it, make sure this is highlighted. You can then right click and say format data series if this pane isn't here already. Click on the full bucket and let's change the color here to blue. Let's click on marker. And again, let's change this color to blue. Let's close it. And let's add some formatting. So go to chart design, add chart element, and we need a legend. So let's go down to legend and let's have a legend to the top. That looks great. And then again, if we want to add a title, let's go to add chart element, chart title, and let's say above chart. And let's double click the chart title and let's just call it furniture and clothing sales by month for 2022. And that's how you do a line chart. Okay, so in the same project, project four, let's cover histogram. So I am on the histogram tab. Now, whenever you think histogram, I want you to think about buckets or bins because that is what a histogram represents. So histograms were actually introduced in Excel 2016. A histogram displays a count of items in several buckets. So let's look at our data. So we have the student name and we have a test score, which is a percentage. And a histogram would be able to assign buckets. So let's just say if we have a bucket between zero to 30%, and then count how many students actually got between 0 to 30%. The next bucket would be 30 to 60%. And then the histogram would count how many students got between 30 to 60%. Okay, so to create a histogram, we select our table, we go to insert, and then click the histogram icon around here. So it should be this icon right here in the middle. So you can create a histogram, a Pareto chart, as well as a box and whisker. So let's click on histogram because that's probably the most common one. And now Excel has created a histogram for us. And what we can see here is that we have six students who have received between 13% and 47%, and nine students who have received between 47% and 81%, and then five students who have received between 81% and 115%. If you do want to change your size of your bin, maybe 13 to 47% is quite big for you and you want to go smaller, we can. And start at 13% because that's what the lowest student has got. So let's change the actual width. So let's go ahead and click on your bars, right click and say format data series. And if you go to this icon here under options, it would have something like bin width. And this is where you can actually change your width of your bin. So I want to have bins maybe 
every 20%. So I'm going to say 0, 0,2 because it's a percentage. And enter. Okay, now you can see our bins are from 20%. And then if you want to do some other formatting, you can, but this is a basic histogram chart. So now we have these bins and now we know, okay, so there's four students between 13 to 33%. Two students between 33 to 53%, seven students between 53 to 73%, etc. Okay, and that is a introduction to histograms. One of my favorite charts to do on Excel is spark lines. I feel like it really transforms your spreadsheet. So a spark line is usually a small chart that is displayed in a cell. And it's nice because it allows you to spot any time-based trends or variations quickly in the data. So because parklines are used in a specific cell, they're often used in a group. So for instance, let's look at this data set. So I have a product called either dresses, shirt, pants, belt, and shoes. And I have some months from January to December. And these cells represent the sale for your specific product per month. So it would be nice to have a spark line here to just dictate the trend of the sales per month in a nice little line graph or bar chart. And this would be for dresses. And then for shirts, we'll do the same thing. So have a nice little line graph or bar chart that just displays a trend of sales from January to December. And that's how spark lines can actually come into good use. And just a note that sparklines are essentially mini charts, but they don't have the same features of a chart. For example, a chart can display a lot of data points or a lot of series of data, whereas a sparkline is only allowed to display one series. So let's create a sparkline. So for sparklines, you don't select the whole table. You just select your data. My data is between B2 to B6, all the way over to M2 to M6. And then let's go to the insert tab. And this is where we would insert a chart. And right next to it is where you would insert a spark line. So if we click on spark lines, we can see that Excel supports three different types of spark lines. So let's just click on the line one. Now Excel is going to ask us to select the data range of the spark lines, which we have already done which is B2 to M6. And now it's asking us, well, where to place the spark lines? And we can place it just at the end after December. So you're going to go from M2 to M6. You don't need to include a header and click OK. And now we see these spark lines have been generated. Let's make column N a bit more wide, just so we can see it a bit better. If you click on the cell, you immediately can note that it references where's the data from. And when you click on the cell, you'll see that this tab spark line appears and this is where we can do our formatting. Let's have a look at the other spark lines. So let's select all of these cells. So let's select N2 to N6 and let's make sure we go to our spark line tab and now let's change to column. As you can see very similar but now from a line chart it is a column chart and let's choose win loss. So a win loss is a binary type of chart that displays each data point as a high block or a low block. So this obviously works well with percentages where the positive percentages would be high and your negative percentages would be low. So we don't need to use a win loss here, but why don't we do maybe a column chart just because the graph's small. So I feel like you can see it better with a column chart. And now let's do some formatting. So on our sparkline tab, you can edit your data if you want to. Again, you can change your sparkline type. You can also highlight like the high point and the low point. Okay, so if we click on high point and low point, we can see that these are highlighted. You can also highlight negative points if you do have any, but this set doesn't have any. You can also highlight the first or the last point. And here you can change the formatting. So maybe we don't want this blue and red. Maybe we can change it to a black and blue or a green for high point and you can see slightly the red is for a low point and gray, which I like. However, if we do want to change it, you can just go to marker color 
you'd be able to change per group. You can change the color depending on the type of point. So if it's a negative point, maybe you want it red. If it's a high point, you'd want it green. If it's a low point, you'd want it orange, etc. And you can also change your sparkline color. So if we click on the small arrow by sparkline color, here you can actually change your sparkline color. So maybe you want it black instead of gray, or you want it orange. You can also have an axis. So if you click on axis, and if you click on maybe a date axis, so now this axis window pops up. We're starting with the horizontal axis, which is your X axis. So the X axis would be our date axis. And now it's asking to select the date range. So let's click on this white cell and let's select the date range, which is from B1 to M1. Again, click on the white cell again. Let's click on show axis and click OK. You can also show axes. So if you click on axis here, it takes you to the axis window and starts off with the horizontal one. So our one would be, our horizontal X axis would be date and a Y axis would be sales. So this would be a date axis. It asks you to select the date range for the spark line. So before we do that, I'm going to cancel because this is just text and I want us to change this to an actual date. So on B1, let's change it to Jan 2022. And once you've done that, I want you to click on B1, click on the bottom right corner of the cell and just drag it across until December. Let's just save this workbook while we're here. Okay, let's go back to our spark line. So let's select our spark lines again, N2 to N6. Click on spark line, and now let's edit the axis. So let's go to the axis here. And now it is a date axis, so we're working with a horizontal axis. So let's select date axis and the range. So now we need the date range. So let's select the white cell and let's select B1 to M1. Click out. Let's click show axis. We don't need to plot data left to right. It is already in order, but usually when you are doing a date axis, it should be plotted in your date order and click OK. So you can fiddle with axes here. So if there is something wrong with the axes, you can fix it. So if you click on axis, here you can change your horizontal axis. If you want maybe a date axis, which it is already, you can. But this is just in case it reads maybe an incorrect axis or you wanted to read a different axis. You can also click show axis as well. And then vertical is the same as well. So if you do want to edit your axis, you can Click on axis here and you can edit it in case maybe you want to change your axis or change something like the max or min values, you can do so here. And if you do change to a line spark line, if you click on line here, you can also add markers. So if we click on markers here, you can see we'll be able to add markers as well. And obviously, if you didn't know this, you can make your spark line as big or as small as you want. So maybe you want to increase the size. So if you increase the size of your row, your spark line will get bigger. And then if you want to fix the size, you can just click the corner button and then just see what width you want. And let's make in maybe a bit smaller. And those are spark lines in Excel. Now we are going to touch on developing dashboards, but in order to do that, we actually need to know a bit more about pivot tables and from their pivot charts, and then we'll be able to build some interactive dashboards. With that being said, the next few sections are about pivot tables on Excel. It's pivot tables. So we are going to be on project 5.xlsx, and you just have one tab here called data. Now, pivot table feature is perhaps one of Excel's most prize winning features. It's a very sophisticated component in Excel, and it's popular just because it's so easy to use once you get going with it. So a pivot table is essentially a dynamic summary report that can be generated from spreadsheets. It can also be generated from external data files as well. So let's have a look at our data. We have an office supplies data, and it just has details of when your order has been made what was bought, the units, the unit cost, the total cost, the rep who made the sale, and in the region that the rep 
belongs in. And let's just say that we want to know the following. We want to know, well, what is the total cost per month? What is the total cost per rep? What are the most popular items by unit sold? What type of items do people buy more per region? How many reps per region bought items? And which region buys the most items? Now, doing this manually, you'd have to get your calculator out or use a bunch of formulas, and it's just not optimal. It takes too long. Let's create up of a table. What you can do is if your data is in a worksheet, I usually just select any cell within the table and go to insert and click on pivot table. And now a pivot table window is opened. And if you selected any cell in the table, Excel automatically detects your table range. So as you can see now, it starts from A1 all the way until G44, which is correct. You also have the option to use an external data source, but for this course, we're just going to work on Excel itself. And now you can choose where to place your table. Do you want it in the existing worksheet or do you want it in a new worksheet? So if you do select existing worksheet, you usually need to select the table or the range where you want it placed. But I generally like having my pivot tables in a new worksheet. So let's leave it with new worksheet and click OK. I'm just going to zoom in. Okay, so now you see the sheet one gets created and let's just rename the sheet to be called pivot table. And we see that this structure is now created. And if you click in the structure, there's something called pivot table fields that pops up. So how this works is essentially in your pivot table fields window, you're able to drag and drop in the fields or the columns in your spreadsheet here in these four options. Filters, so maybe you want to filter the data or just show a specific part of the data, like a specific region, a specific sales rep, etc. This is where your filters occur. Columns, so on your pivot table, what do you want as a columns? Rows, so on your pivot table, what do you want as a rows? And then this basically means some values. So what is it going to do with the value? Remember, value is measurable. So for instance, if we want to see total cost by region, my region would be in my rows and I would see total cost as a value sum because that's a value and I want it summed. So for starters, one of the first questions I was asked is total cost per month. So I'm going back to my pivot table and let's bring in order date to rows. So just click and drag it and you can immediately see some things happening here. So we have a year. And if we click that plus sign, it expands to month. And if we click for 2022, it does the same. Great. And now let's bring total cost to our sum values box here. Yeah. And now you can see Excel tells you what it's done. So what it's done is that it's taken any rows that have an order date in Jan, and it's taken the sum of the total cost. So if we go to the sum values and sum total cost, and right click over there and click on field settings. You can actually see that Excel has summarized the data by sum, but you can also do a bunch of other things. If you wanted the average total cost, you can click on average. And if you click on OK, it now shows you the average total cost per month, which is pretty cool. Let's go back to some values in the corner, right click field settings. You can also do something like the max total cost, the min total cost, the product, you can do count, which doesn't make sense here because it is a price. You don't count prices, you sum them up together. And some other statistical values. I'm going to stick by sum and click OK. Now, some people may see something like quarters in here. If you do, don't worry. I'll show you how to get rid of them and also to sort this data out in maybe a slightly better way. So let's do that. So if we click on our pivot table, you'll notice that we have pivot table analyze as a tab now. And what we can do is when you're working with dates, sometimes you don't want it to show like this. So what we can do is group it. So if you click on group selection, here you can decide how you actually want your dates to be filtered. So if you want something like years, quarters, and months, then you have to select all three. So if you hold control or command, if you're on Mac control, if you're on windows and select years, quarters, and months and click okay. Okay. You can see now we actually have 
quartz is showing up. We go back to group selection. And now let's just display years and months and click OK. And this actually shows us our first question, which was the total cost per month. You can also do other things, like maybe we want to have total cost per month per rep. So let's click on rep. And just as a test, let's add it to rows. So click and drag it to rows. So let's click on rep and drag it to rows. So what we're going to do is let's remove some of total cost. So you can just click on the field and just drag it out. And you can see it removes. And let's bring in rep. And just for layout purposes, if we bring in rep and drag it and drop it under rows, let's see how that looks. Okay. And now let's bring in total cost and drag it to values. So now we have per month, the total cost per rep. So for Jan 2021, Jones made 189. For Feb, Kibble made 999. If we don't like this layout, so click on rep under rows and drag and drop it under columns. Yeah. So now we have a different view. So our reps now appear here. And the nice thing here is that you get a nice total here. So you can see how many each rep made for the year. So this would be for 2021. And then this would be for 2022. And if we go right down, we have a grand total, which would be for both years. We can see it by month, which rep has made how much. And we also have the grand total, so we know how much money was made per month as well. Okay, so let me just check what we've answered here. So we've answered the total cost per month, and we've done the total cost per month per rep. So let's try and figure out the most popular items by units sold. So let's create a new pivot table. Let's move our pivot table to the right. So if you click on the pivot table tab, so just drag it to the right. And what you can do is go to data. You can go to insert, pivot table. We're going to keep all of this the same, store on a new worksheet and click OK. The shortcut is that people usually just duplicate this pivot table and then, you know, move the stuff around, but that's fine. So sheet two, let's just move it to the right. OK, I'm just going to zoom in a bit. OK, so now what we're going to do is the most popular items by unit sold. What would we need here? We would need items. So let's click on our pivot table. Let's make sure pivot table fields show up. If this doesn't show up, maybe you've mistakenly closed it. You can go to pivot table analyze and field list. If you click on that, it usually then shows you this window. So what we need is most popular items by unit sold. So let's select item. Let's drag it and drop it to rows. Okay, perfect. So we have items here. And now what we need is number of units. So let's click on units and let's go to some values. Awesome. So this is where we have number of units. We have our most popular items. So now what we have in this pivot table is our items and then the number of units sold. If we want to sort this from maybe largest to smallest, you can click on your cell, right click. Click on sort and let's do largest to smallest. Okay, now the sorts from largest to smallest. Okay, you can rename this to pivot table item sold. And let's go back to pivot table tab and let's just call this pivot table and space sales by month by rep. You may not fit everything, but that's fine. All right. Now, while we're here, let's just have a look at formatting. So if we go to design, here you can actually change how your pivot table looks. So maybe you want subtotals here, which we don't really need because we just have one field here. But if we want to do something like, let's do region. So let's click on region and let's bring it to rows. Make sure your region is above item. This will show us item sales by region. And now let's work with this. So if we go to design and we click on subtotals, here maybe you don't want to show subtotals, or you do, but you want to show it at the bottom of the group, which takes place here. Or sometimes you want to show it at the top of the group. So you click on subtotals and you show it at the top. Grand totals, the same thing. So maybe you want it off on rows and columns. So now we don't have any. You want it on for both rows and columns. So usually it would show us a grand total here. If maybe we had something like 
months. So if we go to our pivot table sales by month, we have our grand total for our rows and a grand total for our columns, which you can also remove. Going back to pivot table item sold and going back to design. If you just want it on for rows or if you just want it on for columns, so it depends on you. You can also change your report layout. So if you click on show in compact format, this should be it. If you click on show in outline form, okay, this is where your region becomes its own column, item becomes its own column. In tabular form, which is generally quite popular, and then you have the option to repeat all your item labels, or you have the option to not repeat them at all. You can also do something like if you want row headers bolded, if you want column headers bolded, if you want banded rows and banded columns, and here is some more formatting that you can do. So let's create another pivot table and let's do the shortcut. So let's right click on our pivot table item sold tab at the bottom, click move or copy, and let's click on pivot table item sold, click create a copy and click OK. Okay, let's just move that to the end and let's change this to pivot table items per region. If we go back to pivot table items sold, let's just remove the region from there. Yeah. So essentially pivot table items sold should just show this. And then pivot table items per region should just show this. This is useful because we can see what people buy per region, what's more popular. And again, if you want to sort it, just click on the cell, right click, go to sort, largest to smallest. Okay, let's create one for how many reps per region bought items. Right click on your tab. So I'm using pivot table items per region. Select move or copy. Select move to the end and select create a copy. And let's double click on the tab name and let's call it reps per region items sold. Okay, so now what we're going to do is let's just deselect everything and start from fresh. So let's start with region and two rows and let's do units and let's bring that to values. And let's bring in rep and bring it down to rows. Okay. So this answers how many reps per region bought items. So we know for central, we can tell how many Andrew bought, how many Jill bought, for East, we can tell how many how it bought, etc. If you want to bring your rep to columns, you can click and drag it to over to columns, which I think looks a bit better for analysis purpose, just because we have grand totals. We can determine the totals per rep. And then here, the grand total determines the total per region. So it's often quite useful to have that data all in one table. Right. And then finally, we have which region buys the most items. So let's go again. So let's right click. Select move a copy, select create a copy, move to the end and click OK. And let's double click on this tab and let's call it region most items sold. Okay, we're just going to remove columns. And this would essentially be the region and we have some of units. So over here, let's just move the rep from columns. And we should just have region with some of the units, which is awesome. Now, what if we want to know the different types of items sold? So how many types of items? That would mean we would want a count of item. So let's bring an item and let's bring it into values. And you can see immediately Excel already knows, hey, item, which is like pencils, pens, rubbers. It's not a value, but you bring in it into value. So we should count the different types of items. Okay, so Central sells 24 different types, East sells 13, and West sells 6. Now, let's say, for example, we go back to our data table. And let's actually change a region name. So let's change one of the region names, whatever you want, East. And let's just call that North. And we're just going to do one. So on B2, on my data tab, I'm changing B2 from East to North. And let's click on our last tab, which is region with most items sold. And now we notice North doesn't appear, but you can refresh your pivot table. When you refresh it, 
will actually take into account your source data and the changes. So if we right click our table and select refresh, okay, we can see North appears. So it's very, very useful. Okay, and that's pivot tables in a nutshell. In the next few sections, we'll discuss pivot table analyze and then finally pivot table charts. Okay, so before we move on to proper filtering, let's discuss adding percentages to our pivot tables. So we are on the tab pivot table item sold, and I have this pivot table which shows me the items and the sum of units sold. Now, what if I want to add another column that shows me the percent of the total? So I want to know, well, for binders, how much did we sell in percent compared to the total? So what we can do here is two options. So the first option is if we just want to show percentages, you can click on any cell, right click, go to show values as, and then you have a lot of options here. You can show percent of grand total, percent of column total, percent of row total, percent of parent column total, and percent of parent row total. So usually percent of grand total or percent of column total works because we are working on a column and we just have one column. So either two can work, but let's just do percent of column total. Okay, now we can see that we now show percentages. So binders made up 34% of the total units sold. Let's click on undo. Now, if you want to display both your sum of units and then your percent, what we can do is all we need to do is create a duplicate column. So let's bring in units again and let's drag it and drop it to some values. And we say sum of units two. Let's right click and let's click on field settings. Let's change the field name to percentage of units sold. And let's click on show data. And over here we get a few different options. So maybe we do a difference from the first column the percentage of, percentage difference, running total, and a whole bunch of options. So let's do again percent of column total and click OK. Okay, and then obviously if we wanted to do the percent total in terms of rows, it would be percent of row total. So let's talk about adding filtering and slices. So first things first, let's talk about adding filtering. So I am in my pivot table sales by month by rep and if we click on any cell let's open up our pivot table fields window and now why don't we test out filters so let's just say i like this table but what i want to do is be able to filter by region so let's select region and bring it to filters and now we see a row appear on the top and if we select this top drop down we'll be able to select different regions so we can search for region and let's Uncheck select all and just select east. And now our pivot table just shows us sales by rep by month for the east region only. Now this filter actually works well with just non-measurable fields. So for example, categories such as rep, region, item doesn't work well for measurable values. So if we bring in another filter, so let's bring in item and bring it down to filters. Now we have the option to filter by item. Let's choose pin. So now we have sales just for the East region with the item pin. Now, if you bring a numerical value, you'll see how it appears and it actually doesn't appear right. So I'll click on units, which is numerical because that's number of units sold and drag it to filters. And now click on the filter. We can see that it just gives us a number value. And if we do click on a filter, all this means is that it's going to show us any orders where two units were sold. So you generally won't use filters for any numerical values. Let's go back to select all and let's just remove units from a filter. And let's go back to our filters and let's just select all just so we show our full table. Right. All right. So now that that's done, let's talk about a better visual representation of adding filters, which is known as slices. And there's two types of filters that are more visual that you can add on Excel, a slicer and a timeline. A slicer is good for working with categorical data, like I said, data that has string of characters, like your items, your rips, your regions, and timelines are good for dates. So make sure we click on our table and let's add some slices. 
Let's go to Pivot Table Analyze and let's click on Insert Slicer. Here, Excel will ask us what we want to see. So let's do maybe region, rip, and item. Okay, the rest are numerical, so they are not good for slices, and order date can be a timeline. So let's click OK. Okay, now we have three slices appearing, and you can just move it to a better position, which is what I'm going to do. You can also make it as big as or as small as you want. There you go. And now if we click on East, we can see our pivot table filters on East. And if we click on this filter icon here, it goes away. If we click this multiple check mark icon, you can actually multi-select items, which is also pretty cool. And then if you click out, it will go away. And what you can do is you can click several different options and your pivot table will filter. So over here, we're looking at East region. Now, if we want to add a date filter, we would need to add a timeline. So click on your pivot table, click on pivot table, analyze, and now let's insert timeline. As you can see, this window pops up and it just shows us what's applicable, which is order date and select. Now what we get is a nice timeline where you can select the actual months where we're going to see Jan 2021 that shows us Jan. Or if you hold shift, you'll be able to select more than one month. Okay, so this is very useful if you just want to look at specific months quickly, then timelines are great. And that's how you use timelines and filters on Excel. So to click out, you just select this filter with a cross, and now we're back to normal. And that's how you use filters, timelines, and slices on Excel. You're done with your pivot table. And now what you want to do is maybe you think, okay, this data looks great, but it would look better as a chart. There is a feature in Excel called pivot charts, where you can create a chart version of your pivot table, which is great. Let's go to pivot table items per region. And we go to pivot table analyze. And you can see right here, we have pivot chart. We click on it, we immediately get a chart populated based on the format of our pivot table, which is awesome. You can also change your chart type. So if you right click your chart and select change chart type, you can. Okay, you'll also notice if we change our pivot table, so if we remove an item, both our table and our chart changes. You'll also notice if you remove anything from your pivot chart or your pivot table on our pivot chart fields window at the right here, Okay, just make sure you click on your pivot chart. Let's move the label item from axis. Okay, and you notice that your pivot chart changes as well as your pivot table. Let's click the undo button. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it like this because I like this chart. And then just a note, if we go to pivot chart analyze, you can also add slices and timelines as well, and they will function the same. So if we click insert and let's do a filter by region and click okay. Now, if we click on one, we'll notice that a chart and a table filters. If we clear it, it will do the same. Okay, I'm just going to delete the slicer. So you can just press delete or backspace. Let's just change this title because we are going to be developing a dashboard in the next lecture. So let's call it items sold by region. Let's move on and create some more charts. So let's go to pivot table items sold. And why don't we do a pie chart? So make sure you click inside your pivot table, go to pivot table, analyze, click on pivot chart. And now we have a nice chart here, which shows us the items and the sum of units, but let's change it to a pie chart. So let's right click our chart, click on change chart type, click on pie, and then select any one you want. Let's do, let's just do a donut just for a change. Now, if you click on your chart and you go to design tab, you can notice you still have similar formatting. It's exactly the same formatting as when we covered charts. So for now, let's just add a title. So click on add chart element, chart title, and let's do above chart. And let's just call it percent of units sold per item. And feel free to format the charts however you like. If you 
want to take some time doing formatting, changing the font, changing the slices, go ahead. We will be creating a dashboard out of this. Okay, so let's do one more pivot chart. Let's go to reps per region and item sold. Click on your pivot chart. Go to pivot table analyze. Click on pivot chart. I do want to change this a bit around. So click on your pivot chart to make sure this window is open. And then where it says rep as legend, let's bring it down to where it says axes. And let's bring region as re legend. So let's click on region on the top and bring it to legend. Okay, that looks a bit better. And again, let's just add a chart title. So click on your chart, go to design, click on add chart element. And let's just do a chart title above chart. And let's call it units sold by rep. Okay, so we now have three charts. We have our units sold by rep. We have our items sold by region. And then we have our percentage of units sold per item. So in the next lecture, we are going to create a little dashboard. So let's discuss dashboards. Now on Excel, you can create interactive dashboards by using pivot tables and extension pivot charts. Why is that? Well, because we do know that with pivot charts and pivot tables, we have slices and timelines where a user has this nice interface that they can click on buttons and the data will filter. Which is why when you're using dashboards, it's often good. So if you do want to create a dashboard on Excel, one, you have to create pivot tables then create pivot charts, and then create your dashboard. We've done our pivot tables, we've done our pivot charts, now we're going to create our dashboard. So let's click on a new sheet, and I am just going to zoom in a little bit here. And what we should do here is maybe rename our sheet one to dashboard. Let's just click on the corner button and let us fill this in white, because we are going to be designing a dashboard. So what we need to do is we have our pivot charts and we actually need to move these pivot charts to our dashboard tab. So if we go to the tab pivot table item sold and now let's right click the pivot chart and select move chart. This is where we move our charts. Either we create a new sheet just for this chart or we can have it as an object in another worksheet, which is what we want. So we're going to click on object in and make sure it's on our dashboard worksheet and click OK. And you can see it appears on our dashboard worksheet, which is great. Let's just bring in all our pivot charts to our dashboard sheet. So that's done. Let's go to the pivot table items per region. Let's click on our pivot chart. Let's right click, say move chart. OK, object in and make sure it's on our dashboard sheet. Click OK and just move it wherever you want for now. And then our last one, which is in items, which is in the reps per region, item sold tab. Just right click on our pivot chart, click on move chart, and let's do object in dashboard and click okay. So now you just decide however you want to place your dashboard. So I'm going to make this maybe a bit longer and this a bit shorter. And then I just want you to leave some space, maybe like that. So leave like a quadrant or a square because we are going to be adding our timelines and then leave a section here for a heading. Now we have our charts in here and the next thing I want to do is bring in my slices and my timelines because I want to filter my data. So click on a pivot chart, make sure you are on the tab pivot chart analyze and click on insert slicer. Now we can select some slices. So let's do region, rep, and item. Okay, order date needs to go in a timeline. Remember, because it's a date and numerical values don't make good slices. So this is perfect and click okay. All right, so this is our slices. And for now, let's just spend some time to resize it. Just to make everything fit, something like that. And now if we click on a slicer, we notice that it will only filter our chart on the right. So I want to actually click on a slicer and all three charts need to filter. So let's select the region slicer. Let's right click 
and click on report connections because this is where we can link the slicer to all our charts in our sheet. And now here, we need to actually select where the slicer is going to apply. So you can just select everything and click OK. Let's just select the multi-select for all slices. And now let's try region again with maybe two regions. Yeah, perfect. Our data is filtering. Let's do the same for rep and item. So click on rep, slicer, right click, report connections. And then you can click on new pivot tables. Now this would filter all our pivot tables, even in our sheets, but it's fine for now. Click OK. Let's check if rep works. Okay, rep is working great. Clear to clear the filter and then item. So right click item, click on report connections and let's click on all our pivot tables and select OK. Okay, an item is working. Perfect. Let's bring in our timeline. So click on a pivot chart, pivot chart analyze, insert timeline, order date, and click OK. Just size it a bit. And if we click on a month, we notice only this chart filters, not everything else. So I'm just going to click clear filter. So click on your order date timeline, right click, select report connections, and again, Click on all our pivot tables and click OK. So now if you click on a month and if I'm holding shift and let's just go shift May. OK, our whole dashboard filters. And lastly, we can add a title. So let's just add a title. So I'm just selecting from B to M and I'm selecting merge and center. So let's just call it sales dashboard office supplies. OK. And let's centralize that and let's make it a bit bigger. Now, obviously, feel free to play around with the color schemes, formatting, font, etc. It is your dashboard, but this is just the framework. And this is how you create a good dashboard on Excel. The next few sections can basically be described as a bag of useful Excel tricks. And one of the first things that comes to mind is just working with dates, learning how to subtract and add dates. So that's what we're going to be covering. Working with dates in Excel can be a bit frustrating. And in the section here, we are going to run through how we can add from dates, subtract from dates, add months to a date, or even years. So I have this table here. So we are on project six now, and let's have a look at the dates tab. I have this table and essentially it is a company that delivers goods or orders to customers. So I have order date, I have region. So I have a date which the order needs to be shipped by. I have the date where the order is actually shipped. I have the order price and we are going to be developing some calculations here. So let's talk about adding or subtracting dates. So as long as your dates are in the date format, which we know how to do through this little bar here, you can add or subtract them. And the answer will always be in days. So I have a column here called difference between order date and ship date. So why don't we calculate the difference between the actual ship date and the order date. So let's click on cell F5, type in equals. And all we need to do is minus the two dates. So let's start with the bigger date, which is ship date, D5 minus an order date, which is A5 and type equals and type enter. So now we know that there are 93 days between the order date and the ship date. So let's click on F5 and let's drag it all the way down. Yeah, and as you can see, so we subtracted two dates and we got a difference, which is also in days. So we know that approximately from July to October, there is about 90 days there. So it does make sense. And then if you want to add dates, exactly the same method, but instead of a minus sign, it would be a plus sign. Key point to note here is that always make sure that your dates are in a date format. You can also add and subtract days to a date. 
So a good example is in this specific scenario, the customer service people need to call the customer five days before the order needs to ship by. And they probably need to call the customer just to make sure that they are aware of the delivery. So we want to know the date that our customer service team needs to phone the customer by. So that would be our ship date, which is the need to ship by. So we can use this date here and we need to minus five days from that because that would be when the customer service team needs to phone the customer. So to do that, we can go to H5, say equal sign, and let's select C5 and then say minus five. Okay, so essentially we're taking five days away from C5, enter. Okay, so the customer service team needs to phone the customer on 28th of September because the customer's delivery should go out by the 3rd of October and that's five days before the delivery goes out. Let's just click on the corner right of the cell and drag it down. You can also add or subtract months to a date. But the trick here is that you do need a different formula because remember we can add or subtract days to a date without a formula, which is fine. But now if you want to add months to a date, we need a formula. Obviously we can do something like plus 30 and that would be 30 days, which is a month. But if you actually want proper months, then you would need a formula. So there is a formula called eDate and with eDate you can add or subtract months. So a good example of this is that our customer service team needs to actually call the customer two months after the ship date. Maybe just as a courtesy call, just to see if the customer is enjoying the product. So what is the date? So we are going to go to I5, type in equals, and let's bring in the function eDate. Open brackets. We need our start date. So our start date is our ship date, which is actual ship date which is D5. And now how many months are we going to be adding? So if we were going to be subtracting months, we'd have like minus two, but since we're adding months, we'd have two months. Close brackets and enter. That means that our service team needs to call the customer on the 6th of December, two months after the product was delivered on the 6th of October. And let's click and drag that down. And as I said, if you wanted to minus months, it would be minus two. Enter, and you can see this is two months before the ship date. Let's just bring that back to a positive. Adding or subtracting years to a date, the quick way to do it is just to add 365 days. Now, we need to send a follow-up email one year after the order. Okay, so to do that, we'll say equals, and let's add 365 days to our order date. So let's go to our order date all the way here on A5. And we're going to say plus 365 and enter. And then you can click and drag. So this would give you one year after. There is unfortunately no direct formula at the moment to add a year onto a date. If you want to send a follow-up email two years after the order, we'll say equals and let's bring in our order date, which is A5. And now we're going to say plus two times that 365, that should give us two years, and you enter. You might say, well, this isn't entirely accurate because what if there's a leap year, then it would be a different amount of years, which is correct. So to do it the harder way, I'm going to just delete K5 to K11. And to do it the harder way is a bit of a workaround. So the first thing we need to know is that there is a function called date. Okay, so equals date, open brackets. So let's work with our order date. So what is our order date here? 5th July, 2022. So let's start with the year 2022. Semicolon month would be seven, which is July and day would be five and close brackets. Okay. So now we have our order date here. And what we can do is to add two years, all we need to do is on 2022, we can say plus two, and then that would take us two years, but that's very manual because that means we need to manually input all our dates and then add two years. So it doesn't make sense. Okay. But now instead of passing these variables in, we actually pass in our date variables. Okay. 
So our date variables is that we can actually extract parts of a date using functions year, month, and day. So here's an example. So I'm just scrolling all the way to the left and working on A13. And if I just want to get the year out of this date, all I need to do is say equals, type in the function year, open brackets, and I am selecting A5, close brackets and enter. And you can see this gives me the year. If I want the month, I just need to change this to month and enter, and it gives me the month. Then if I want the day, I just need to double click, change month to day, and it gives me the day. So knowing that, we can now apply this and nest it into this formula. So instead of 2022, what we can say is we say backspace, year, open brackets, and it's A5, I think is the order date, close brackets. Okay, so we take in the year, plusing the two years, and in the same here, month. So seven, which is July, would just be month. Open brackets, A5, close brackets. And then day, which would just be day. Open brackets, A5, close brackets. Now this should add two years to my order date because here's my plus two. And here I've extracted each date part using the year, month, and day functions. So when you really press enter, you can click and drag, and there's two years. And this one here, if you want to add seven years to your date, you just have to remove the two and say plus seven and enter. And now this would be seven years. I'm just going to click undo. And that's a bit of a workaround to add years. But if you do want to add it properly, this is how you do it. If you just want to add it quickly, you'll just do plus 365. So we have used an if statement and it is quite similar to the if statement. But the sum if function returns the sum of cells that meet a single condition. This criteria can be applied to dates, numbers, text, etc. This company here has some late orders. And by late orders, I mean the date they need to ship the order by. The actual ship date has passed the date that they needed to ship the order by. So that defines a late order. And this company actually gives their customers discounts for late orders. So what we want to know is we want to know the sum of the total orders, so the sum of the total order prices that are late. And in order to do that, we will be using some if, but first, maybe let's determine if an order is late. So I have a column here, column G, and we want to know if the order is late. So here we can use our normal if statement. So on column G5, let's select equals. Let's bring in our if statement, open brackets. And we know that if our actual ship date is greater than our need to ship by date, then it's going to be late. So if D5 is greater than C5, semicolon, let's open quotation marks, semicolon, and let's just say one if it is late and zero if it's not. So one if this value is true. So if D5 is greater than C5, if our ship date is greater than our deadline date, then yes, it is late. Value of false is just zero. Close your brackets and press enter. Okay, let's just drag that across. Perfect. So now we know that there are three late orders and what I want to do is actually sum up the order price of these late orders. So that's why we're using sum if, because we want to sum up the order price of all of these late orders and display them in this column in the cell here, B17. On B17, let's press equal sign. Let's enter our sum if. And now it's asking us for our range and criteria. So we're looking at whether or not the order is late. So let's select G5 to G11. So our range is G5 to G11, semicolon, our criteria. And with sum if, you need to put your criteria in quotation marks. So our criteria is if it's equal to one, close your quotation marks, semicolon, and what are we going to be summing? So we are going to be summing our order price. So from E5 to E11, close brackets. So what are we going to be looking at in order to sum up the value? So we're looking at our is order late column, and that's our range G5 to G11. We're looking if 
this value is equal to one, because if it is, it's late. If it's zero, it's not late. And then lastly, what range are we going to be summing? We're going to be summing order price, which is E5 until E11. You press enter. And here we go, it's telling us that the sum of all order prices that are late is 121,000. And if we click on the order price cells that have that is order late equals to one and hold control on Windows or command on Mac and this one, we can see at the bottom, the sum is 121, which is correct. So with that being said, how would we sum the total orders that are on time? Okay, so let's use sum if again. So capitals, so sum if, open brackets, our range again, we want to know orders that are on time, which is the same, this column here, so G5 to G11, but our criteria, so semicolon, our criteria is changed because now our criteria would be, instead of it being equal to one, it's equal to zero, because zero means that it's not late, one means that it is. So in quotation marks, we are going to say equals zero, those quotation marks, semicolon, and then our sum range, we're summing up order price, those brackets, enter. And then we have the sum of total orders that are on time. We can also sum, example, the order prices for a specific region, for example, a north or west region. So let's figure out how to do that. On B20, let's type in equals. Let's bring in some F. Open brackets. Our range will now be region because I want to know if the region is north because I want to sum the order price for the north region. So let's select the region column, semicolon. Our criteria would then be equals and then north, just as how you see it, those quotation marks, semicolon. And now what are we going to be summing? Let's sum up order price again and then close brackets and enter. Okay, and now what we're saying is that the sum of order prices for North region is 67,000, which we can have a look. So if we select this cell, which is the North region and hold control if you're on Windows and command if you're on Mac, and then the other North region is at the bottom. Yeah, that gives us 67. I want you to pause the video and try and do it for the West region. And when we come back, I'll have the answer. Okay, so. This is my answer, 126,000. If we look at the formula, I said our range is from B5 to B11. Of our range, we're just looking at where it's west. Okay, so there's our equal west. And then our sum range is we want to sum the order price, which is E5 to E11. And pressing enter gives us 126,000. If we want to check it, we can just click on these two cells where our west region occurs and we have 126,000. Okay, that's how you use sum if. Let's talk about hiding rows and columns. So sometimes you don't want people to see specific data, maybe a column that's just for calculations or maybe something that's just not important. So for instance, maybe we want to hide all of our East regions because we don't really need that data. We can select our rows, so you can hold control or command if you're on Mac, like that. Right click and say hide. Now we don't see any of our East region rows. And with the columns, you do exactly the same. So maybe we don't want to see column F. So select column F, you can right click at the top and click on hide. Now you can see the hidden rows and anyone would be able to access them. You usually see a green bar in between. So we go from A, B, C, D to G. So F is missing here. And over here we go one, two, three, four to seven and then to nine. So we know that five, six, and eight are missing. So to unhide, you can just select the rows, right click and say unhide. Okay, and the same with column. You can just select the columns, right click and click unhide. Data validation on Excel. So now sometimes on Excel, maybe you have a column or row and you've decided that this column or row can only have numbers within a certain range. Or 
a certain column must only consist of text and not numbers, or, you know, a certain column can only consist of dates and nothing else. You can use data validation in Excel to actually fix the format of your columns or your rows. So to do that, we can click on the data tab here. And now let's decide what we want to fix in terms of formatting. So let's do the is order late. And I want to just fix it to have values that are just zero or one and nothing else. So you can select column G and then in this icon here where it says data validation, click on the arrow and click on data validation. Okay. If there's an alert here, you can just say yes. So this is where you can choose what you want to fix. So over here, I am just allowing a decimal and I'm allowing it between a minimum of zero and a maximum of one. Okay. So that would fix the formatting. You can also decide for an input message. The input message would be shown when a cell is selected. If a cell is selected, let's just select this input message and input message. We can say, please make sure this value is either one, which means order is late or zero, which means order is on time and click OK. And you can even have an error alert. So when the user inputs some sort of invalid data, what happens? So you can even have an error alert pop up. So you can choose a style. So where it's a stop warning or information. Okay. So stop won't let the user input it. A warning and information would just be almost like a warning. And you can have a title. So let's have only one or zero is allowed. An error message, please only enter one or zero and click OK. And now if we click on our order late cell, we can see that this comes up and then make sure value is either one or zero. Please make sure this value is either one, which means order is late or zero, which means order is on time. And if I change this, so if I just backspace it and let's do seven and enter. Okay. Our error message appears now and we're saying only one or zero is allowed. Please enter only one or zero. So we click retry and we enter zero. It lets us put it in. If we want to edit it, we can click column G, go to data validation, click on data validation, and this is where we can edit it. So maybe instead for our error message, instead of stop, let's have just a warning and click OK. Let's see what this does. So let's just click any cell and is order late. Let's backspace and let's press six. Okay. So now we have a warning. So it says, please only enter one or zero. We can say yes or no. If we say yes, it lets us bypass it. So a warning would let us bypass it. Again, let's check what information does. So if we select column G, go to data validation, data validation. And let's change the error alert now to information and click OK. And now let's put in five. Okay. It then tells us only one or zero is allowed and press OK. And it doesn't do anything. So that's data validation. Now what you can do is if we click on the arrow just on the right of data validation and we say circle invalid data, okay, it will then circle the invalid data. Since we selected this as well, it will circle this, the column header. And then to remove the circles, you can click data validation and click clear validation circles. And that's data validation. In Excel, you also have the ability to remove duplicates in your data. So let's create a duplicate. So let's go to row 11, command or control C, and then paste it on the row below. So command or control V. By using that same data tab, we can actually remove duplicates. So let's select our table. Let's go to data. Let's click on remove duplicates. It then tells you the level of detail, then tells you what we need to define a duplicate by. So if you want to remove duplicates based on, you know, if every column is duplicated, then you would need to select every column. If you just want to define duplicates as maybe if two columns are duplicated and you just want to delete those rows, then you would just select those two columns. But for this one, it's fine for all our columns and click OK. 
Okay, and it tells you the one duplicate was value was found, which is that last value. And that's how you remove duplicates on your table. Grouping. So you can also group similar rows and columns in Excel, which is critical for building and maintaining a well-organized and well-structured spreadsheet. There is a function called group on Excel that you can use to actually group similar rows and columns. So a good example is that we have our table in our project six data tab. And this section here is just some additional steps that we were doing, and we actually don't need to see that. So what we can do is that we can actually group this. So if we select from row 15 to row 30 and go to our data tab, and you'll see that there's a section called group and ungroup. So click on group. We've now grouped these rows together and you'll see that an additional sort of line shows up or bracket and there is a minus sign at the end. And if I click on the minus sign, it actually contracts the group. And if I click on the plus sign, it opens it up. So you can also do that with columns as well, the exact same procedure, but it's nice when you need to clean your worksheet or you notice that your spreadsheet has different sections that you would like to contract or expand, you can use grouping. Okay, so another little trick in our bag of tricks is filling in blanks in Excel. So on project6.xlsx, I want you to go to the fill in blanks tab. Just going to zoom in here. And sometimes you get a table like this. So this is a sales table. You have the customer name, you have the order ID, you have the product and you have the sales. And sometimes you have these random blanks. And how this works is that if it's a blank, it means that it takes a row on top. Okay. So for example, J Tom with order, with order ID 23453 bought these two products in this one order with this different sales. So essentially J Tom also bought a bag, which is large in the same order. Okay. R green as well. So this here all belongs to R green and all belongs to this order. P violet, all of this belongs to P violet, all of this belongs to the same order. So essentially what we want to do here is populate the blanks with the actual customer and order it belongs. Okay. So something like that. So yes, you can do it manually for a small table like this, but if you have a very long table, you don't want to do that manually. So you can actually fill in the blanks. So to do that, we select our table, we select control G. So control on windows and control on Mac. You then open your go to tab here and we're going to select special. And now we're going to tell Excel to look for blanks. So click on blanks. And now you notice this here is a tool where you can select certain formats. So this would select all blanks, or you can do something like select all your notes or select all formulas, and it would do that on your selected range. Okay. So if you click okay, so don't press anything yet, but you notice that all the blanks are selected on your first blank, we are going to say equals, and then just click the cell above. And before you press enter, press control enter. Okay. If you're on Mac or windows, it's the same control enter. And now you find that all your blanks have been populated with the row above. Now, if it was the row below, you would do equals and the cell below. And that's a nifty way of how you fill in blanks in Excel. Searching for text on Excel. So there can be a scenario where maybe in a column, you want to find a specific phrase and you can actually use Excel search. The Excel search function actually returns the location or position of one text string inside another. So for instance, search returns the position of the first character of the text that you're finding inside your cell. Now search is not case sensitive, which is great if you're working with the reviews or you no know, data that's physically typed by someone. The find function is case sensitive. So if you're finding a phrase and you really care about the case and whether or not it's capitals, you can use find. But for this scenario, let's use search. And here I have a table with actual email addresses, not ID numbers. So you can change that to email addresses. So I have a table with email addresses and I just want to know if this email address is an Outlook email or if it's a Gmail. 
Okay, so let's use search. So on C7, let's type in equals, search, open brackets. What are we finding? So we are finding Outlook. So let's say outlook.com, close quotation marks, semicolon. Okay, and where are we finding this within? And we are going to say B7. We don't need a start position here, so we can just close our brackets and press enter. Let's click and drag all the way down. Right, and as you can see that it returns the position. So if you count, you'll actually find that Outlook starts on the 11th character, but it returns the position if Outlook.com exists in the phrase. And now all we need to do is instead of it displaying numbers or if it doesn't find anything it displays an error we just need to insert the is number function is number will return true if it's not a number it will return false so just before search you can type in is number open brackets and then at the end close your brackets here so we know the output of the search if it gives us an error it's not an outlook email if it gives us a number it is an is number is a function that looks for a number and returns true. And if there's no number, it returns false. So you can press enter. Okay. That's how the function looks. And when you're ready, you can click and drag. Now, remember I said that search is not case sensitive. So let's go back to our formula C7. And instead of outlook.com like that, let's do a capital O. Okay. And press enter and click and drag. Okay. And you can see it returns still accurate results, even though we changed the case. In this formula, we said look for Outlook with a capital O, and this only has Outlook with a small O, but it still returned true. The next example is where we figure out if an email address is a Gmail address. Let's do that by using find. So go to D7, type in equals, and let's do find, open text, can see very similar to search. So what are we going to be finding? And let's do all capitals for Gmail. Okay. Semicolon within text. So we are going to say B7. And we can close the brackets and enter. We did say Gmail, but remember it's all in capitals. And this is a Gmail address, but you can see it doesn't return anything. So this is case sensitive. So if we remove that and Type in Gmail again, small cases, and press enter. Okay, there we go. It's given us a number of the position where Gmail starts in our cell. And now all we need to do is encase this in our is number function. So is number, open brackets, and at the end, close it, and enter. And click and drag. So the main difference between search and find is that search is not case sensitive, find is case sensitive. Otherwise the two are quite similar. So I'm still on project six, but I'm on the tab using search and we're having a look at this. Now freezing rows and columns in Excel makes navigating your workbook or your spreadsheet a lot more easier. And when you do it correctly, the chosen panes are actually locked in place. And it means that your specific rows or columns are always visible no matter how far you scroll. So as you can see for long tables, it's very useful. So if we are going to look at project six and we are looking at the printing, freezing and locking tab, we have a long table here. And the first thing I want to do is I want to maybe freeze this top row. Click on a view. And in the view pane, you actually have this nice function called freeze top row. And if you click on it and scroll, you can see that your top row freezes. To unfreeze, you can just select unfreeze panes. Your top row unfreezes. You can also freeze the first columns. So if you still stick to your view tab, go to freeze first column. And now if you scroll right, you can see your first column freezes. And then to unfreeze, you select unfreeze panes. If you want to customize it a bit to freeze a certain number of columns, all you have to do is select the columns that you don't want to freeze. So let's just say we want to freeze column A and B. Then all we need to do is select the columns that we don't want to freeze. So C, D, E, and F and say freeze panes. Okay. And if you scroll right, you'll see column A and B stay. 
let's select unfreeze paint and then with the rows it's the same now if you want to freeze maybe column a and b you can just select the column just after the columns that you want to freeze and select freeze panes and now you can see a and b are frozen and the rest move okay let's click on unfreeze panes the same with rows so if you want to maybe freeze the top three rows just select the fourth row click freeze panes and now you can see everything else scrolls except the first three rows and let's click unfreeze panes Let's talk about locking and securing your worksheets. So I'm still on project six under the tab printing, freezing, and locking. Now, sometimes when you share an Excel file with others, you may want to protect your worksheet just to help prevent it from being changed. So we can do that on Excel. On the printing, freezing, and locking tab at the bottom, right click on it and select protect sheet. And here you can have a password if you want. So let's have a password of one, two, three, four, and let's verify that one, two, three, four. And here you can also check the actions what a user can do. So maybe a user can select the lock cells and select unlock cells, which is fine. Maybe they can do some sorting. They shouldn't format. They can't insert rows. They shouldn't edit. They can use auto filter and that's it. Okay. And click okay. So now what we've done is we've actually protected the sheet. And if you try and type anywhere, you'll notice you'll get an alert. So you won't be able to do anything. And then to unprotect it, you can go to your review tab at the top and you can select unprotect sheet and you'll need password, which is one, two, three, four and click OK. And now you're back to editing. Now, there can be a case where you want to lock specific cells in an Excel worksheet. So for instance, maybe you want to lock certain cells from being changed, but still allow users to adjust other cells in the worksheet. So in our example here, we just have some sales data and let's just say you can allow your salespeople to edit the sales data, but they shouldn't edit the columns and you just want to lock the first row to make sure that they shouldn't change the columns. You want to keep the columns as is because you're using it for dashboards and reporting and you don't want to change the columns, but they can change the data. All you need to do is select what you want to be locked, right click, click format cells, then go down to protection, uncheck locked and click OK. So the first thing you need to do is just to select the cells that you don't mind your salespeople changing. So that would be our data other than our column names. So just select right click and click on format cells go to protection and just uncheck locked okay locked is always by default then go to review go to project sheet and you can enter your password here or and click ok and now what you'll find is that someone can come in and edit this but they can't edit the row that you didn't unlock Okay, which is pretty cool. To unprotect your sheet, again, click on unprotect sheet and enter your password and click OK. Similar, you can protect your whole workbook. So if you select protect workbook, you'll need to input your password and to verify it. And then every time the workbook is opened and this will protect your whole workbook for any editing. And in this section, we're going to be covering printing. So often Excel worksheets don't always look great on paper because they're not designed to fit on a page. They're designed to be as long and as wide as they need to be. So this is great for editing and viewing on screen, but it does mean that your data might not look nice when you print it on a piece of paper. However, this doesn't mean that it's impossible to make an Excel worksheet look good on paper and it's not that difficult. So how do you print an Excel spreadsheet? So we're still on the printing, freezing, and locking tab. And if we go to file and print, and this is how our page looks. It's a tiny little table on the top left and your one might look a bit different. But while we're on here, this is where you do your normal printing. So this gives us a print window. 
And the first thing is Excel actually tells you how it looks when it's going to print. And as you can see, this isn't feasible. Our table is tiny on the top left of an A4 page, but we'll discuss that later. You get to choose your printer here. You can decide how many copies you want to make, if you want to print all pages or a range or a selection. If you want to print in color, you can change your paper size as well. If you want to collate your pages, if you want to print your active sheets, your margins, etc., which is fine. But let's fix this here because I want this to at least be page width length. And it doesn't matter if it's one or two copies, but I want to be able to read it. So let's click cancel. So let's see the print area. So let's select our table. So you can select A1 and press shift and control if you're on Windows, command if you're on Mac. So shift, control, command, right arrow, and then still holding command and control down. And that should select your whole table. Okay. And go to page layout. And here's where you can change things like the margin, the orientation of the page. But the most important is your print area. So click on print area and select set print area. So now Excel knows to only print this and nothing else in your workbook. Let's see how that looks. Go to file, go to print, still small. Okay, we're going to change it. So this is where you can do the shortcut, which is called scale to fit. It looks much better. But the only thing I don't like is that on the second page, it doesn't have your column names as a first row. It just continues. And it's sometimes when you're reading, you know, the second or third page, you'll have to go back to the first page if you want to know, you know, what a column name is. So I actually want the column names to appear in each of the pages. Okay. So what we can do is we go to file and go to page setup. Okay. And here again, you can change the orientation if you want portrait or landscape. And I want you to go to sheet and where it says print tile. So we've set the print area, print tiles. We are going to repeat the rows at the top. So what rows are we going to repeat? Let's click the white cell and we are going to repeat this row. So just click on the first row and click the white cell. And here you can decide new print options as well. If you want grid lines, if you want black and white, etc. If you do have columns that you want to repeat, you can also input that there. And click OK. Let's click File and let's click Print. You'll find that if you zoom in enough, you'll see that the first row of page two is actually the column names again, which is great. The other thing you can also do is if you do want to make a table a bit more smaller, there's another way of doing it. So select Cancel, go to File, go to Page Setup. And if we go to Page, over here, and we can actually change the percentage. So let's do maybe 70% of your normal size and click OK. And let's see how that looks. Go to File, go to Print. OK. And now you can see it's just a bit more smaller. And this works really well if you have very wide tables and you do want to get most of your data in. What you would do is go to File, Page Setup, Page and adjust this until you're happy. But for now, we're just going to go back to Fit2, click OK, File, Print, and this looks perfect to me. I have two pages, the data is nice and clear, and I know that in every page, I'll have that first row of my column names. Thank you so much for watching my course and choosing me as your instructor. Make sure you follow my social media, the links are below for any more content update. And I'll see you next time. Bye.